I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare. Do you want to play psycho? What do you want? Can I be the helpless victim? We all go a little mad sometimes. Don't fall asleep. Welcome back, gays, ghouls, and everyone in between to our podcast, The Horror Bandwagon. The podcast where I make my scaredy cat, skeptical, and wonderful fiance watch horror movies with me. That's me. I'm the fiance. My name is Sergio. And my name is Cody. And we are boys for horror analysis, criticism, and spooky, ooky, and sometimes kooky entertainment. And Cody, my dear, what are we doing for today? Well, guys, we figured just before Halloween season ends, we are going to talk about Halloween ends. A movie that has obviously united the horror community. <laughs> Nothing honestly can be further from the truth. But guys, that is right. We are going to be talking about 2022's Halloween Ends, the obviously definitive finale to the Halloween franchise. We expect nothing further to happen. Michael Myers will only be a memory from here on out. I cannot wait until the sequel when it turns out that Laurie is in a mental institution because she can't deal with the fact that she put somebody else's body through a shredder with Michael's mask on without ever taking his oh, mask off. It was another elderly man, unfortunately. But folks, we are not tackling this finale to the franchise alone. We are joined by the ever so iconic, ever so fierce, probably the most feet pick requested person we know Nick from the Nick Says Boo YouTube channel. Um, Hi. Yes, with the feet pics. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm sorry, but like, if I search on Twitter, like feet pic, and it, it'll automatically go to you. I think. Oh my gosh, the, the number of people that request that. Like, I'll post something on Instagram. Like, I like like the focus of the image is the fact that there's a horror movie on the TV in the background, and you might see a toe in a sock, and then people. Uh, I don't get it. I don't oh get my it. God. But I'm shame. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, just for everybody out there, if you if you are into that, can you give the people at home what are your what, what size are your feet? <laughs> 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 can you give them that? <laughs> Well, I got a size 14 clown shoe. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With one enlarged toe, it's fine. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I just wear pool flippers. Nick says boo. Nick, welcome to the show. Uh, we are seriously super honored to have you on. How are you today? I am doing very, very well. And I am very, very honored to be on the show. And I thank you guys so much for asking me to come on here and talk about my favorite horror franchise. It also lucked out that you love this franchise because um, I didn't quite know that beforehand, but it, we're, we're, we're in good hands then now because it could have gone really uh, far off if someone was like, this franchise is shit. <laughs> Oh, no, th th this ain't uh, the horror hour over here. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> George ain't here. <laughs> that, that would be a long episode. <laughs> oh, um, but before we move on, tell the folks at home who are possibly watching, where can they find you? Let them know. So I have a reaction channel on YouTube, um, primarily horror, obviously. Uh, Nick Says Boo is the, the channel name, and you can find me on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and I have Patreon, where I welcome people to give me their hard-earned money. <laughs> <laughs> and they do. They, they just, just, like, send it over. Oh, thank God. Thank God. <laughs> I'm tired of being poor. <laughs> I hear ya. I hear ya. So let's get over to Halloween franchise as a whole. What are your overall thoughts of the Halloween franchise, your personal opinion, your favorite timeline? So I live and breathe the Halloween franchise. I uh, my, my mom is the one who got me into horror movies when I was very, very young, much too young. Um, and I, like, I can't even remember the first time that I saw it. I always mm. joke and I, I say like, <laughs> I feel like when I was in the womb, my mom was like pressed up against the TV and I could just like hear the theme song. <laughs> yeah. uh, but like growing up, whenever we had, when you know, we're cleaning around the house or doing anything around the house, we always had a horror movie on in the background just as background noise. Yeah. When I used to go to sleep, I'd be like, mom, turn on Halloween so I could fall asleep. And I was like six. It's just, it's always been there for me. Uh, the original Scream was the first movie that I ever saw in a movie theater. Oh, uh, you're so lucky. It, well, <laughs> oh, well, <you> <laughs> um, thanks, mom. But uh, Halloween H two O, oh, Halloween H two O, that was the first one that I ever saw in theaters, 
And it was just such a magical experience for me. And I've seen every single one in theater since. I try to see them at least two to three times before streaming mm -hmm. became a thing. And I don't necessarily have to go to the theater to see it. Um, but my, I will say this, because I know that I talk a lot of shit online about Halloween Kills. I love every single, well, not love. I like every single movie in this franchise. There's just mm -hmm. some that I like less. But at the yeah. end of the day, if, it, if, if Michael Myers is in it or it's about Halloween, nine times out of 10, I'm going to like it. The ones that I like the least would be like Halloween Kills, Halloween Resurrection. And the original is my, not just my favorite, but my favorite movie of all time. Uh, but the H2O storyline, that is, that's it for me. The Holy Trinity is one, two, and H2O. We stop. <laughs> we stop at H2O. <laughs> I have said it repeatedly. I'm sorry. Halloween Resurrection does not exist in that timeline when I'm rewatching it. I have to stop at Halloween H2O in order to live in my fantasy that Laurie Strode just happily lives happily ever after at the end of that movie. Um, exactly. It's oh, <laughs> that ending. It's so like, it's so cathartic. It is still effective today. We just saw it the mm -hmm. other day. And I'll, the moment where she's like breathing and you hear the sirens in the back. It's kind of like the, the moment of relief, like after what she's been through. Ugh, so good. <laughs> I love it. You said something before that was really actually uh, really great was that like overall, I will watch, rewatch these movies, even the worst ones. I mean, I probably won't have a good time with Halloween Resurrection and I feel like I give a lot of shit to Halloween Resurrection. Um, there are parts of it, maybe a minute or two or in it that are really <laughs> yeah. great. Uh, we have a whole episode where we kind of bashed on it. I feel so sorry for Halloween Resurrection lovers out there. Um, but uh, even like once, like uh, Halloween 5, those Halloween 5 was one of the first ones that I saw besides the first one because I saw it on TV. Like I, I that one has like a little special place in my heart, even though, yeah, there's a lot wrong with it. Oh yeah, two, two, four, and five were like I felt like AMC Fear Fest yes. felt like it was like that was all that they had programmed. Just those three movies. That's over the and only over. ones they wanted to buy. The other ones were too expensive, and we're like, okay, fine, we'll show all of these. Perfect. Yeah, but five, like you said, five is is not without faults. They all, I mean, honestly, even the original, they all have faults. Yeah, but I think for me. I know like people kind of shit on the franchise when it comes to how many like continuities it has. Mm -hmm. But I think we're at the point now where it's like, it's like James Bond, where it's just every couple of years, you have a chunk of movies that's its own thing. It's its own version. And then it wraps up. And then a couple of years later, you get something else, which is part of the reason why I'm like on some of the people's reactions towards Halloween ends. I'm like, you're going to fucking get another one in like five or six years. Yeah. Chill out. <laughs> That it's is not that serious. without without a doubt exactly. All right, guys. So now it is officially time to go into our body appetizers segment, and this is a segment where we go uh, and talk a little bit about the tidbits of this movie. So let's start with Halloween Ends. The release date was recently October fourteenth, twenty twenty two. Budget was around twenty million dollars. Opening weekend, it made over $40 million, and it grossed so far over $67 million. Uh, so it was directed by David Gordon Green, of course, from the previous one. He's actually working on, apparently, on the Hellraiser TV series. Uh, he has a hand in, well, he's directing the original, the remake to The Exorcist. Um, he is going to be also, uh, this man is getting jobs, upcoming Garbage Pail Kids uh, TV series, but he also directed films like Pineapple Express, Your Highness, and The Sitter, which were all like very like stoner comedies. <laughs> so this was a very big departure. And I think when the original one came out, everyone was like, whoa, he's they're, they're directing a, um, a horror film, a pretty right. like uh, legit franchise horror film so I, i'm sure he had like a lot of pressure on him um it was written by paul brad logan uh as well as chris bernier they both actually just contributed to halloween ends they didn't contribute to the previous installments but uh, danny mcbride and david gordon green also contributed to the writing to this film as well so our cast for this movie is jamie lee curtis as laurie strode andy matichak as allison nelson 
Will Patton as Deputy Frank Hawkins, Rohan Campbell as Corey Cunningham. Is it Rohan or Rowan? Oh, I don't know. I think it's Rohan. Rohan. All right. Um, Kyle Richards as Lindy. Uh, Kyle Richards as Lindsay Wallace, and James Jude Courtney as Michael Myers or the Shape. There we go. There's a lot more. There's a lot more new characters that there in this, of course. Um, well, they're dead. So exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Corey Cunningham is a new character inspired by Arnie Cunningham from Christine 1983. This is the reference that we were talking about before. Uh, when we are introduced to Corey in Halloween Ends, he is shown to have a similar haircut, an identical blue button-up shirt, and a pair of black glasses reminiscent of Arnie's and Christine. Now, you haven't seen Christine. I have not seen Christine. I've seen Christine many times. Again, Christine was one of those like, AMC horror like <laughs> a month yep. showings. I've seen it so many times. Uh, so I immediately got that reference, and I I love that it's another John Carpenter entry reference to, the, to, to his repertoire. Right. Yeah, they had that, and I think they're watching the thing in the beginning, right? They're watching the thing, uh, which is also like a throwback to the original one where they were watching the old school thing. Um, so that's that's cool, though. Stuff like that I always find funny because I always think of it as okay. So they're watching the thing that is directed by John Carpenter, but he also directed Halloween, which is Michael Myers is in it. So in this universe, did he? create is there a character called john carpenter who created a movie version of the original attacks <laughs> it, it's it's like how they're watching scream 2 and halloween yes! h2o <laughs> That's, i always have the same exactly when they show scream 2 and halloween h2o i'm like wait a minute wait a minute yeah people will always comment I'm, like on my h2o video and, they're, and they mention that and they're like doesn't that like create a paradox and i'm like it's not a share like it's, <laughs> it's not as serious it's like a goofy hats off so in June 2018, Danny McBride confirmed that he and David Gordon Green had originally intended to pitch two films that will be shot back to back and then decided against it, waiting to see the reaction to the first film. Do you have any doubt that they, the Halloween Kills was, or Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends were the original storyline that they intended to do? Yes and no. I've heard very, very conflicting stories about how all of that went down. Like, I, I knew that they had pitched it as two movies. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the, the original pitch was supposed to all take place on one night. And then Jason Blum was like, well, let's see if the first one is successful. If so, then we'll talk about greenlighting a sequel. And because the first one was very successful, instead of giving them a sequel, they said, make two more. And to me... That explains a lot of my grievances with Halloween Kills because Halloween Kills just feels like we had a story for two films. We have no idea how to break this out into three. So the second one just feels like a play around in the sandbox while we figure out what the fuck we're doing. Yeah. It was like definitely it, like you're sitting in the holding room and watching just like highlight reels of Michael Myers killing people. Like it. it there's exactly. not much to it. Like it's a lot of kills with a very, very little story and very stupid characters. <laughs> it's it's entertaining, but it's just it it feels undercooked because what? like they didn't know what to do with yeah, it. Yeah, you could have made this like a like 20, 30 minute beginning of this movie and then had it be like four years later and just cut to the rest of whatever this was. Right, because honestly, if you take out Karen's death. If you if you if you take Karen's death and you throw that at the end of 2018, does kills is it even necessary to have kills? I was but that was my it, next it question. It changes the storyline, none zero. <laughs> exactly, it really it really doesn't. It just I mean it got it kind of makes the whole. They're just yeah, they're just more deaths, which you could just make 2018 a little longer, or maybe cut some other things that weren't necessary. But my next question was, do you think it it was it would be fine that halloween kills wasn't necessary you can honestly just watch halloween 2018 and just go into without the idea of you know karen dying of course yeah i think it, i think i mean you could have kept karen alive or killed her off either way i mean they didn't really do much with karen um but <laughs> i love judy uh, whether, greer love her yeah i love judy greer whether whether she's in it or not um i mean yeah you could throw in maybe a couple more kills into 2018 and then just sort of say Okay, well, we all think that he burned 
in the fire, but we never found a body. So we're like, we're not sure. But Nick, <laughs> evil dies tonight. <laughs> so, oh my god <laughs> no. Cody loves to just <laughs> my favorite stab joke. people with evil dies tonight I hate it I, and, and like my favorite person in the movie that says that isn't even Tommy because ugh <laughs> It's it's the first time that like somebody else has it. It's in the in the hospital. It's like a woman, and she's like, "Evil dies tonight." And I don't know why she delivers the line that way, but it's everything. It's so goofy. In defense of it, though, before we move on to the next little tidbit, Uh-oh. I I actually do think that the in, the the purpose of the movie, in context of having watched Halloween ends, is about how it just took over the town. That it was no longer just a Laurie thing. It was a, the entire town Mm -hmm. was invested in this thing now. And because that comes up frequently in Halloween ends that there are other people who aren't Laurie who are affected by this. And so I think that it did a really good job, at least of showing the, maybe hysteria is not the right word, but the, just the, the panic of the town with Michael being out there again. Well, again, I, I think that's why I feel like you could take Halloween kills and kind of splice it into 2018 and make just one movie instead of three but obviously this is like you know, money <laughs> like they, they they want another movie to go in each year yeah i think when kind of to what you were saying cody i think the halloween ends sort of recontextualizes what they wanted to do with the preceding two films it's 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 kind of like it's Halloween ends feels like the third and final draft. Whereas 2018, they were like, oh, we have all of these ideas, and they homaged the structure of kind of like the original and and uh, maybe the second one and H2O and stuff like that. They yeah. they had the structure for that, which is why it feels like a quote unquote Halloween film. Mm-hmm. Halloween kills feels like that's when they started to get these ideas of. Well, let's like think about how, uh, where it's no longer just a Michael Myers chasing babysitters and Laurie Strode. Let's get uh, deeper into this. Let's let's look into the psychology of it and how this affects the world around them. But it 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 was very undercooked. They didn't know what to do with it. And Halloween ends comes around, and they know what to do with it. They understand the the story that they're trying to sell mm-hmm. and they're trying to tell. Retro, like it's like hindsight is twenty twenty. Yeah. Like this yeah. is the story that we wanted to tell, and it and it kind of makes you feel bad, at least for me, because it's like if they had understood this vision and the story that they wanted to tell back before they made 2018, I feel like the trilogy as a whole would have been everything. They would have been yeah. effectively been able to sell the story that they wanted. It's just they didn't figure out the story that they wanted until 28. Uh, what are we on? Ends 2022. <laughs> <laughs> If that makes sense, what I'm saying. But like, no, yeah. I still don't particularly, I don't think that Kills is a good movie, but I understand now in hindsight what they were trying to do with Kills. Yeah. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be finally talking about this movie. We're going to get to it. We'll be right back. Welcome back, ghouls. It is now time to go into our Meats and Potatoes segment. Yes, and this is the segment where we actually go into the movie itself. On Halloween night in 2019, 21-year-old Corey Cunningham is babysitting a young boy named Jeremy, who pulls a prank on Corey by locking him inside the attic. Dick. Uh, Just as Jeremy's parents come home, Corey kicks the door open and accidentally knocks Jeremy over a staircase railing to his death. Corey is accused of intentionally killing Jeremy, but is cleared of manslaughter. Thoughts on this opening scene? I was gagged. I was (laughs) gagged. (laughs) I laughed and I was like, please, no one else hear me in this theater. As soon as she was like, what happened? And then he hits the floor. I was like, ah! Girl, I, I couldn't. I I let out a chuckle. I had to, mostly because I am the same way when it comes to kids. I think as I'm growing older, I as I'm growing older, I I have a little bit more sympathy towards kids because we want a child at some point. Mm-hmm. But 
they're just, horror movie children sometimes are annoying. And oh, yeah. This, this kid was no exception. You felt you felt bad though. You were gagged. I did you were feel shocked. bad. I mean, number one, I was gagged because I was like, they didn't need to like show me his body hitting the floor. <laughs> I didn't need to see that. But I like this. Just made me sad because like obviously his intention was not to hurt the kid. Right. Um, he was just trying to get out, and the kid was. I mean, kids are not always known for being the smartest animals, and they uh, <laughs> he was just standing right in front of the door. Uh, I mean, my my question looking at it was, you know, why not try both doors first? When you look at the top of the stairs, you see that there are two doors next to each other. When you see from inside the attic, the attic is wider than just that one door. Why not try the right. other door, too? The kid can't hold both doors shut at the same time. Yeah, I, I also didn't, uh, putting aside, okay, uh, as we all know, me and children, ugh, and I, I'm very similar to you, like, you know, if Chris Evans wants to have a kid, I am down. But <laughs> looking at, you know, the opening scene seriously, it, yeah. I, it's very, very effective. It's very well done. Um, I didn't quite understand when he was up in the attic, if there was, if, like, is he supposed to be afraid of the dark? Because I didn't understand why he got so angry. And started kicking the door and screaming like it was like he was like having a panic attack. Yeah, or that's the thing. Like I, at some point when we were watching the movie, we were just like, "All right, calm down, calm down." Like, just be like, just wait a minute and have you know talk to the kid for a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, I'm not uh, my thing that later on I kind of try to connect to it later on is that fear of. Uh, michael myers yeah for me is that like there's still that essence of like michael myers is the, the body was never found and now th the whole town is in fear so maybe like having that he's a babysitter by himself he gets locked in he's kind of nervous and kind of goes off of that well and bit. he he like the movie shows you that he notices that knife is taken from the kitchen so i think that like in the back of his mind maybe he's thinking okay maybe the kid took the knife but like maybe he's also thinking what if michael myers is actually here because it is halloween and michael myers does kill the babysitter it's like kind of what his whole deal is so i mean i'm gonna be charitable and say that maybe he was just thinking that he was up there with michael and he just kind of freaked out a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's probably what it is. I will say that I I had to explain this to a friend the other day, uh, and she was like, you know, why did you like the movie so much? And I was talking about how I'm like, well, technically, you know, the bad guy in the movie isn't Corey. It's not Michael. It's evil. Like, and she mm -hmm. was like, I know, like, you're getting, like, metaphorical. And I was like, no, no, like, it's, and I think people don't get that. It's evil within this uh this trilogy is supposed to be an actual like thing like an entity yeah, yeah exactly that, that spreads and infects and i thought like it's very very clever the way that they did it with with jeremy is because the mom says to corey that jeremy has been having nightmares and a kid who is now picking on somebody and scaring somebody else like mm -hmm. that doesn't always compute like uh, i thought he was afraid of the dark it's because it's another way that we're seeing how fear affects somebody and makes them hurt people hurt people. Yes. Okay. It's like it's like the child version of him uh, lashing out against somebody else. It's it's the anger. It's the fear. It's the evil. It's, yeah. it's affecting everybody, and it does it in different ways. And I'm like, I see what you guys did there. Yeah. With the kid, he still deserved to go over that railing. Oh, <laughs> but. Well, you know, it, I, okay. It's also the way that the door hits him in the face because it's. I've seen. <laughs> no. It's it's for me. It's We're when he hits the hell. ground and you slightly see him come back up, like he bounces. I, <laughs> that's specifically the part that I hated the most because you not only see his body bounce, you see his neck twist when that happens, and mm -hmm. I'm just not. I don't need it. My biggest thing is like that railing was not a short railing, and that kid was not a tall kid. How in the fuck did he actually go over like physically the railing? I don't understand because the center of gravity is not above the point where that railing is. See, this is Cody's I wanna job. Know, <laughs> I, I want to know who went into the Hamptons and airdropped that house into Haddonfield because <laughs> that thing was massive. This must be like the, the, the better part of Haddonfield, like a certain like rich part. <laughs> like <laughs> The other side of the tracks. <laughs> the other side of the <laughs> But like, you are totally right. I think, I think that also goes with it is the whole fear 
cause I mean the whole town is in fear and we get a little bit of what the aftermath is happening there's been other incidents going around um I think it's with the voiceover with Lori um after the opening credits it's causing other people to do other harmful things in this town and that totally makes sense and this one just happens to be the one that we kind of really focus on um mm -hmm. I will say I was really sad when the parents found out like when the parents found out, that was that was heart wrenching the thing that was especially tragic for me is like, of course, that happens the second that they get home. If they were home like well, two yeah, minutes earlier, too, like... they could have just seen their like their kid being shitty to the babysitter and stopped it before anything actually happened. Yeah, I mean, and even if they hadn't, I think a part of it probably, you know, was Corey yelling out, I'm going to kill you. And then it, it was very just it. it, it a series of unfortunate events because he yells that out just as they walk in. Yes. And then they look up and see him holding the knife. Mm hmm. So, like, I get, yeah, it's, it's just a very, very unfortunate way that it, the events unfold. But uh, I will say, the opening scene has a, it's, it's very suspenseful with him walking around the oh, house yeah. and the, the occasional noise in the background. And then you see a shadow run by and it takes its time with it. And yeah. I feel like the other ones didn't really do that so much in the preceding two installments. I mean, maybe when Lori is like, checking all the rooms at the end of 2018 yeah that was yeah. fairly suspenseful but i thought that this this was the best suspense suspense sequence that they've had yeah and they could have easily gone to a basic route of Corey just killing somebody very a la the the first one where it's like pov and grabbing something and you know but they they really twisted it like i was not expecting this to happen at all and to kick it off i was like oh okay we're going down this route. I, I kind of getting what kind of movie we're we're getting into here. We're we're getting something different than we we have before, um, right? But I also like that, the, as you said, it was very suspenseful and it kind of made the audience feel like you are also in fear, just like this town is. That it could be Michael Myers, and that was my first thought. Like, okay, we're we're getting Michael Myers, but that was not what it was at all. Plus, in hindsight, uh, I noticed this on either my second or third or fourth viewing. <laughs> um, but when they're kind of talking about later on in the movie, like how people treat Corey and um, the indifference that that people have to him and they sort of treat him just like he's not there. Mm -hmm. And they do that in the beginning, like both of the parents. Whenever he's talking to the dad, the dad is like somewhat kind of rude to him like when they're talking about the plants and he was like well yeah well maybe you can learn to like garden yes. better so yeah. he makes a rude comment to him then and then also the entire interaction that he has with the mom he's being very sweet when yeah. he's talking about uh jeremy oh you know it just sounds like you know typical kids and oh we're gonna have a fun halloween and all this other stuff and every single time that she says something to Corey, whatever he responds back she just completely ignores it Oh yeah, yeah. It talks just over disregards him. everything that he says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, they they planted that seed with Corey even prior to that idiot going over <laughs> the banister. <laughs> well, he okay. He talked too much. He just talked too much. He was talking to the movie like he evil was... died tonight. That night, <laughs> it was it was for the best. Anyways, we're go we're going to go over to the opening credits this is an homage to halloween 3 a movie that cody has not seen but he really really wants to we just never get time to i'm sorry i love it i love it so much it's but it's it's out there it's different right uh, obviously oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's not michael myers but it, it's not michael myers and it is uh, whatever if i ever t you know s tell somebody to watch it and i say it's not michael myers but i say when I say that it's not Michael Myers, it's also not just a spooky Halloween movie. It is fantastical. There is a lot of outrageous <laughs> plot <laughs> points that they throw in there when they reveal at the end what the hell is going on behind the scenes. You're just like, what movie am I watching? <laughs> but, but but for me, Halloween 3 is a, um, it's more of like a an aesthetic type of thing that I like about it. Like the mm. score is awesome it's one of my favorite john carpenter scores um uh, that like the town and the way that it's shot and the colors and it it, it feels very halloween like uh, yeah it, it basically feels like to me 
what it felt like walking into a costume store as a kid and just looking around and just seeing elements of everything. Mm -hmm. Because that's what Halloween 3 is. It's just a hodgepodge of everything (laughs) thrown in there. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna make a promise. We're gonna okay. watch Halloween three. I promise. Um, so three years later, the town of Haddonfield, Illinois, is still reeling from the aftermath of Michael Myers' latest killing spree in 2018. Laurie Strode is writing a memoir, having bought a new house and living with Allison, her granddaughter, who is now a nurse. I thought that was very nice to mm-hmm. like catch up with. Um, Lori and knowing that Allison is a nurse and she wants to help people after you know the the previous incidents. I also like, I, I, and this is one of my criticisms of Halloween 2018. I like that Lori spent literally 40 years mortified at the concept that Michael Myers could come back, convinced after one data point that it will happen on Halloween, and like literally like became. <laughs> <laughs> almost militant in protecting mm-hmm. herself and her daughter built an entire house that was designed to be nothing but a death trap for Michael. And, and now like after Michael comes back, she's like, all right, time to move on, time to, time to move on with my life and just be at peace. It, it seemed like very, and maybe it was just the fact that like Michael killed her daughter that she was like, this was not healthy and I need to go to some therapy for this. Um, it's just, it's interesting to me that like, it's such a flip for the character. I will say there is, and I've not read a lot of these, but I read a little bit about this one. The the novelization for this movie has come out. I've been hearing about the novelization. Apparently it's, a lot of people are saying it's good. Uh, I read, it was like a Reddit post and it was like, here are all the things that are in the novelization that are not in the movie. Huh. It, uh, it, like every single thing that I wished that they would have done in the movie is fleshed out in the novelization. And it, Stop. like, I'm very curious when the uh, the Blu-ray comes out, what the deleted scenes are. Because yeah. like the deleted scenes were 2018. They needed to remain in the movie. I don't, One, Like yeah. hands down, it, 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 it uh, so many things that I was like, what the why isn't this in the movie? They're in the deleted scenes. I, I'm assuming they were probably just removed for runtime. Yeah. But uh, there's a lot of backstory and explanation as to what occurred between 2018 and ends with Lori. Like okay. it wasn't a just a random flip. Like okay. she went through a series of different events and interactions with different people that got her to the point of like, I need to go to therapy and I need to stop drinking or otherwise I'm going to lose Allison too. And I've already lost my daughter. But later on in the movie, she does make a, or Allison makes a comment to her, like you pretend like you've moved on, but it's just, it's changed. You're still obsessed with him and you're still obsessed with everything that's gone down. It's just the fit you're putting on a face. Uh, But see, that's the thing. Like for me, I found it kind of comforting. I did like that Lori was kind of settling down a little bit. She was leaning into Halloween, but that also could be, you know, her defense mechanism. Like that's her way of not forgetting about Michael and making sure that she remembers is that she will go full out on Halloween. So that way she remembers, um, you know, cause she was like, I'm baking you a pumpkin pie and it's like burning up and she's being just super wholesome. I did love that she was wearing her like little apron at points, just like how she was in the original one with the pumpkin. Mm -hmm. I really loved it. And, you know, I love when these Halloween movies really lean towards the fall Halloween vibe and aesthetic uh, because it makes me feel good. And I think that's what I wish that Halloween 2018 did a little bit more. And I think this one did uh, a lot of that, which I really liked. Um, like with the Halloween party and everything like that. I liked it. I mean, and don't get me wrong. I I do like... I am getting you wrong. So don't, don't, don't forget about that. I do like the Laurie that we get at the beginning of this movie. I just thought that like without some of that extra context, it didn't make a ton of sense to me. Just like it didn't make a ton of sense to me that like Laurie was still after 40 years like obsessed over the idea that Michael was definitely going to come back for her this year. And every other year she was wrong, but this year she's right. Like I always say that... The Lori that we get in Halloween H2O is a better, like if you switched Halloween H2O Lori and the David Gordon Green Lori, it makes more sense. It Completely makes more agree. sense that she would have built this big fucking trap for him after 40 years yeah. for somebody that she shot twice in the face and then their body disappeared. Yes. Versus somebody that she literally had an interaction with 
for maybe five minutes. Yeah, and that's why I lean towards like Halloween H2O. And I kind of wish that they kept Halloween 2 canon for Halloween 2018. Like, yeah, they didn't want to have the whole Lori being the uh, related to Michael aspect of it. But you could have easily written that off and be like, it's a rumor. They even made a reference to it in 2018. Be like, no, that was just a rumor and stuff like that. Like they hinted at it, but I feel like it would have given it so much more depth and more weight and more justification mm -hmm. for for how Laurie was acting the way that she was, if they did include Halloween too. Right. I mean, up until ends, uh, 2018 and kills, I'm like, he doesn't fucking care about you. And I, does, I, I never, I was like, what is the purpose of removing the sibling angle and telling the audience he does not care about her? But then bringing her back, that that didn't it make was sense to me. It to get asses in seats. The fact it was that to they, get asses in seats. <laughs> the fact that they had a line in the movie that was like, "It's not about you, Lori." I'm like, "But we're here for Lori. Like, we're literally like, Lori is part of the, this your main attraction besides Michael of these of these of this trilogy here." So I wish you know, whenever the, I heard that, I was like kind of offended because I was like, "No, I, I wanted to be about her. I wanted to be like." They're somehow connected in the same way. But I do still also like the idea that uh, Michael is just this evil source that happened to target uh, random babysitters one one Halloween night. You know, I do like that little right. mystery about him. I agree. I agree. So meanwhile, Corey is working at his stepfather's savage yard on his way home one day. He is taunted by high school bullies and injures himself in the process. What do you think about these new characters here? These new, uh, pretty much cannon fodder for, for Michael. I can't get past the one with the haircut and the eyebrows. I don't, uh, uh, of all people to be running their fucking mouth. Really? With those yeah. eyebrows? I don't think so. It was like, no, 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 sweetheart. We're not going to do it. Well, you have a really good looking guy, even though he's like disheveled. He's still really good looking. Like, you know? Can we talk yeah. about the fact, though, that like, I, of course, like the, the asshole is uh, who's like the head of the group has a varsity jacket. So you're supposed to think he's a jock. But what I'm getting from their outfits is that they're in marching band because yeah. he's wearing marching band like pants well, he says that. underneath the jacket. I didn't catch that. He said anything, but I was just like, like it, it took until the second time I watched this for me to be like, they're not jocks. They're in band. And this guy yeah. is still the asshole jock. Yeah. He, he, he does say something, um, uh, uh, oh, we're we're trying to get beer or something for because yeah. we're in the marching band later. And at first, I thought it was a joke, but then as I was like, and this sounds very stereotypical, but I was like looking at the rest of the people that he was with, and I was like, they're not. Oh, <laughs> you're like, oh, they're not playing bro. sports. And then I was like, because uh, I was like, uh, they have a lot of um, nerve <laughs> to be talking to Lori Strode like this. It, it would make more sense if they were jocks and stuff like that but i think it was uh, supposed to be like a ragtag people of who have been through it because you know they establish uh that the kid's dad hates him so therefore he's lashing out at other people and stuff like that so it makes sense but i was happy when they died they played their their <laughs> roles very well because they were uh, like we i can swear and say anything right oh yeah, oh, yeah. go go for it because they are a bunch of cunts those kids <laughs> oh my god i was uh, you sounded after that huh <laughs> oh, every scene that they were in i was just i'm just waiting i was just looking at the countdown i was like Die. exactly i cannot wait for it at but they some did point, the role well yeah mm -hmm. at some point we were like well they're gonna they're gonna die don't really care about these characters so let's go let's 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 start killing them off i did feel bad for the one girl who tried oh on, yeah on two two occasions but not all occasions to try to get but them she's to still stop. complicit yeah, yeah she was she co-signing was yeah, she, she, she was, was just in the back of me like, guys, maybe we shouldn't do this, and then didn't do anything else about it. Yeah, um, yeah, it's I like mean, saying they murdered everyone, and I just kept the car running. <laughs> no, <laughs> exactly. You were there too. Um, but I, I think her death is in, in that whole segment. Her death was funny to me because I thought she was, I thought she was good, I thought she was safe. Nope, she's she's not safe. She she goes mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Um. But I, I think these characters, I feel like, are the camp side of this movie because they just seem very stereotypical, like, bullies. You know, they, I feel like they weren't as three-dimensional as other characters I, or or they could, they could have been, you know? 
Yeah, I think that really the only sort of development is the whole comment about the dad uh, yes. picking on him. But I don't know. I would say like the, the, the one line, even before you just said that, that I was about to say with those characters that feels very camp to me mm -hmm. is the line where he's like, I thought you were dead. And she's like, you're dead too. Cause like <laughs> nobody would actually say that in, in that yes. situation. They would be yes. like, look out. <laughs> um, uh, but, but yeah, no, I, I, I see what you're talking about. And I will say like, while I always love character development, unless this movie was 15 to 20 minutes longer or these kids had popped up in previous films mm -hmm. which is actually one of the things that i think in hindsight if they had known that they were going to have a corey cunningham character not necessarily even having corey as a main character or a side character with a lot of lines but to sprinkle these characters out throughout 2018 and kills in the background oh yeah so that it didn't feel like they were just randomly tossing them in at the last moment yeah it would have better built like the, the feeling of knowing this town yeah like we've seen like like with with sandra how the how the fuck she survived getting that uh thing in her neck i don't know how she'd live through that i don't know because that looked brutal i mean i don't know how hawkins <laughs> lived oh, after yeah, 2018 that's... but um <laughs> like they like sandra would be a very great example she mm -hmm. popped up very briefly in ends she had sort of the main scene in kills and then she was a very brief side character in 2018 and i wish yeah. that they would have done that with corey and i wish that they would have done that with the bullies like in 2018 to be able to see those bullies walking around the school or something like that or yeah. they were uh, because they would have been younger at that point because it would have been four years ago like they could have had the uh you know the teens in 2018 babysitting or or something you know what i mean mm -hmm. just have them yeah. pop up very briefly to kind of have that th through thread throughout all of them but it, it, in general i'm i'm fine with them they died yeah. they got what was coming to them so whatever <laughs> <laughs> the other thing before we move on that and, and maybe i just didn't catch it when i was watching this i I feel like they didn't really tell us Corey's relationship to who we later find out is his, is his stepfather. I actually thought that he was his actual father, but that's beside the point. Um, it felt to me like it was almost like a, like they were almost trying to go for a reveal when they had him show up to the, to the salvage yard and he's, and his stepfather's like, Corey, you're late. And then like out of nowhere, randomly gives him a motorcycle. And then suddenly they're just at the dinner table together at home. And I was like, why do we need to do it this way? I feel like we could have approached it separately where like you got some hint to their relationship other than just mm -hmm. like when I, when you first watch, you think, Oh, it's just like this boss is just trying to be nice. I mean, this motorcycle was about to be scrap anyway. So why not give it to the kid? Like got then it. you find out he's a stepfather and it just felt kind of like, I don't know. It didn't make a lot of sense to me why they felt the need to do it that way instead of just coming out and like saying like, "Oh yeah, he's your stepfather, yeah. not just your boss." I th I think the 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 their, the parents their storyline was kind of squeezed in pretty quickly. Their scenes were pretty quick. I I, I get what you mean. Like I wish they were a little bit more fleshed out. I think that goes with like maybe adding a few more minutes to this movie uh, to flesh out those characters. I. I will say that like this is another thing that is very, very greatly expanded upon in the novelization. But I don't want to keep bringing up the novelization because I don't know how much of that was actually like things that were like were discussed with the writers. Or yeah, exactly. Like that, that, that was written. their intent to do. Right. But um, my interpretation of the whole thing with the stepfather and, and the mother, um, <clears throat> I think it's supposed to imply that there is some sort of dysfunctional incestuous potentially molestation yeah. type thing between the mom and Corey. like when she kisses him on the lips and then immediately backs away yeah. i was like there's something going on with that immediately it seemed we like, were uncomfortable <laughs> we were like Ugh. no no i think it's one of those things and you know i'm like i'm very big into true crime and stuff like that so mm -hmm. i i read about all these horrible dysfunctional family relationships that people have and i think it was one of those oppressive households where she was a very domineering 
woman yeah. and she was being inappropriate with Corey for whatever reason. And somehow, you know, the stepfather got introduced and she's probably, you know, she's probably one of those people that finds weak people that she can manipulate and keep mm. under her hand. And I like that to me feels like the stepfather because he feels, you know, he's very quiet. Yeah. And he kind of like looks down when he's talking, uh, when the mom is present, but with the motorcycle, my interpretation was that because he says, don't tell your mother about it. Yeah. So it's like, she doesn't, she wants to keep Corey in this like child, mm -hmm. uh, which is even more disturbing. Like it's, the fact right. that she still views him as a child and the way that she can manipulate and order him around and have that weird bond where she like abuses him, but then also like counters out with love, which is a very- It's manipulation. Exactly, it's a it's, big it's, sign it's, of it's manipulative. It's um, and, and like, that's why she reacts the way that she does when he's texting. Like she doesn't even know at first that he's texting a girl. Yeah, it's like like what are you doing that is not under my control in my house? I don't yeah. like that. Yeah, and then I'm assuming like he probably doesn't have a car and he didn't have a motorcycle, probably because the mom did not want him to leave. Like she was trying to keep him. Yeah, in the town and in the house, which is why he says don't tell your mom because he was struggling to get to work because his work was so far away and he didn't have a car. So it was like keep this on the DL mm -hmm. between you know you and me and then he makes the comment i hope you find love which to me was a very heartbreaking line yes. because it's like it's like a a subtle cry for help from him like he knows the situation he's in and mm -hmm. he's for whatever reason too weak or or beaten down to say anything and stand up yeah against her which ultimately doesn't matter because we know what happens to her but uh like it, I, it, it's very subtle i do wish it was fleshed out a little bit more but i i think it touched just enough it, it, it provided just enough for me to kind of have a little bit of an understanding of like all right so this is the what's homework. going on yeah it's definitely a read between the lines kind of thing and i got i kind of do like how it is portrayed a little bit too because it allows us to talk about it us to discuss right what could be going on and it doesn't have to spell it out for us too much and i think like even when Lori goes to talk to his mom mm. the, when, when she first uh when she like he would be so lucky to, or she would be so lucky to be dating somebody like Corey. And she like gives this laundry list of like why Corey is great. Yeah. And you can see it on Lori's face that she's like, something's wrong here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, 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 something's no. Something's weird. Um, though I do feel like it's, um, I think I, I, this could be just me just reaching, but I like that th this trilogy does reach out and reference other entries in the whole franchise as a whole as to maybe kind of like paying ode to them. But I, I do get like a little bit of what Rob Zombie did in his Halloween um, with the dysfunctional family that uh, Michael Myers uh, had when he was younger and the, the lore that he introduced into the to the franchise. It just gave me a taste of that, um, at least for me. That, that's, that's something that came up. I mean, yeah, I can see it. I, I think I would say that Ends is, in my opinion, the installment out of this trilogy that weaves the homages and references to the other films in effectively yeah. to the point it doesn't feel like fan service. It's it's literally a, if you are a deep fan, yeah. you might catch this. Whereas in like 2018 and especially Kills, if, like, if huh? you've seen any <laughs> Halloween film one time, you the, the references are so obvious. You're exactly, okay. yeah. So an observing Lori brings him to the doctor's office where Allison works. Allison and Corey develop a relationship and later attend a Halloween party where Corey is confronted by Jerry's, Jerry's, Jeremy's mother. After having an argument with Allison, Corey leaves the party and runs into the bullies who throw him off a bridge. <laughs> Things get Ooh, spicy. I was mad. Things get I spicy. I was <laughs> mad. I, w I mean, yeah, I was mad that he threw his ass over but i was especially pissed off when he was like that's my story Ooh, mm -hmm. yeah like just flat out saying like i'm i'm aware i'm fully aware and that's where i don't have the sympathy okay your dad is mean to you Fuck, get over it yeah throwing somebody over an overpass is not okay and yeah. then immediately being like i'm aware of what i just did but i'm going to lie and you better fucking lie about it too that's like he deserved the worst exactly mm -hmm. i was just like man haddonfield just has some like awful people like <laughs> um, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, this whole this whole scene with with them bullying around. I mean, they they are just providing us more reason to be like, oh, they're gonna die at some point, and we're okay with that. I can't wait till that happens. Um, but I do like that they just don't do it right away. Like, they we still get instances of them throughout the throughout the film. Um, how do you feel about the relationship between Allison and Corey? Because I don't really know what the what the world is saying about that right now, but. So people uh, are saying, are they not not about it? They're not about it. I under so I have not seen this movie, but I know what it is about. When I was in theaters and I was watching it, my friend leaned over to me, and he said, uh, "He said this is giving me Halloween mixed with Natural Born Killers, which I know is like a movie about like two people meeting and they immediately are obsessed with each other and then they're serial killers and all yeah. this shit. And it's very Bonnie and Clyde." Mm -hmm. I think I I really really like the relationship and I like how deep it gets so quickly mm -hmm. because that I mean it like that does happen for a lot of people I mean, they're like lesbians like they meet and there's a U-Haul truck <laughs> parked in front about three hours later and I think it, it, it's interesting because Lori manipulated it to happen by bringing in Corey because she recognized Corey as this is somebody who everybody looks at differently yeah, because of something that happened to them, even though it wasn't their fault. And she knows that the same thing happened with Allison and Allison is struggling because as we saw with the, the radio host, like Allison is, is in every way, shape or form innocent in all of this. She didn't do anything. Yeah throughout any of these films and yet people are still vilifying her yeah so Lori sees that in Corey, and she goes well maybe you know let me be hitch right here and bring these two together and i do i mean obviously it doesn't go the way that Lori wants it to go yeah but there is a little bit camp when <laughs> allison first sees Corey, and she's like <laughs> like just completely enamored with him immediately i know uh, love it for sight baby that she just turns him they have a moment they're like giving each other like fuck vibes like fuck eyes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i like and i like like the uh the way that the dynamic slowly starts to shift between allison and Corey throughout the film like in the beginning she's very much the dominant one yeah like she's very uh, not like a bad way but she's very aggressive with him like teach me how to ride this bike i want to get on the back i want you to put your arms around me let's she's joking bang. with let's him saying let's go out like you know mm -hmm. and then it obviously you know switches as the film goes on to where you can sort of see like she's uh, She's into him, but she has a little bit of like something, something, something's not going on uh, the way that it's supposed to here. Yeah. Um, but I do like it. And I think f um, the psychology of it is seeing yourself, seeing your pain in somebody else and connecting on that. And yeah. it's kind of like the way that I, I am a person who like, I, I suffer from depression and uh you become so used to feeling sad and feeling down that it almost sort of becomes like a friend to you. Like it's like, it's a comfort to feel bad because it's all you're used to. Yeah. And if, you know, she lost her mother, what, 30, 40 people of this town were murdered. Her friends were murdered. Her entire world was basically destroyed. Yeah. So she's been living in this state of depression that, I mean, and I don't really, they don't really say whether or not, Allison is in therapy or on medication, but I mean, yeah. I would say it's safe to assume that living with Lori and still living in that town. And the fact that she says like she refrained from leaving the town because she was worried about what would happen with Lori. Yeah. She has all like all of this stuff that she went through is all, all this trauma is unprocessed. So she, she identifies or she sees Corey as somebody like a, an embodiment of her, of her sadness of yeah. what she's going through. It, it's, it's, uh, how do I word it? <laughs> it's finding solace in somebody else's shared sadness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a shared trauma of, of everything, even though they didn't go through exactly the same thing. I, I viewed this relationship from a like storytelling narrative standpoint as her kind of flirting with this idea that she could be someone who just burns it all down. And, Ultimately, like she co she she comes back from that and and doesn't want any of that stuff to actually happen. Mm -hmm. But 
I think that Corey kind of represented her another version of what she could be, even though it's not necessarily what she wants to be. And but I mean, they Corey does kind of call her out during this sec, like right before he gets thrown off the bridge. Um, he does he does call her out and be like, "I'm not someone you can fix." You know, like it's it's kind of he kind of catches on to what's happening a little bit, um, which is kind of like a very big moment for Allison to be like, "Ah, uh, like why why is this happening?" I I don't necessarily know if I feel like i feel like his interpretation of her trying to fix him was incorrect it was just his perception of the issue yeah in no way did i ever think that she was trying to fix him i feel like she saw him as a somebody who might understand what she's going through mm -hmm. and shares the same sort of anger towards the world around her mm -hmm. but also somebody who could get her out she mm -hmm. saw him as her path out and i think corey was so he's not connected with all of these people. He has whatever the fuck is going on at home, but then the rest of the town ostracized him. Yeah. So I feel like he thinks that Allison is trying to fix him and that's not what she's trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're exactly right. She, and that's probably the reason why um, she fell for him so quickly is that she sees him as a vehicle to get out of town. Also his lips. <laughs> yes. But yes. <laughs> This is gonna sound so corny. I don't know why I'm. Gonna, I'm about to say they go all the way, right? Yeah, they do. They mm -hmm. do. Okay. They do boink. They they do boink. They do boink. So he at this point is dragged into the sewers and confronted by Michael. We finally get his presence, people, who eventually lets him go. On the way out, Corey is confronted by a homeless man. Corey stabs the man to death and flees. Now this is where. We're getting a little bit of change of pace here. Um, we we get that whole like he he holds him and he looks into his eyes and it kind of is like feeling like he's looking into his soul and his past and what he's been through and it kind of makes it feel like at that moment that's where like evil has passed on or something like that. Right? Mm -hmm. This is oh I have so much to discuss about this. <laughs> so. One little thing before that I want to mention that I see a lot of people already going, I don't understand why she did this. But right before the bullies show up and toss him over, when she's still talking to Allison, Allison does this thing where she puts her arms out like this yeah. towards him. And a lot of people are like, what the fuck is she doing? And I feel like it's it's supposed to like it's uh, supposed to portray her being vulnerable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, like, like similar to like how with like an, an animal that doesn't know you, how they tell you to go like this so the animal can come up and sniff you. I feel like yeah. that's what she was supposed trying to do in a way. But um, getting back to the, the section <laughs> that we're actually in. <laughs> I loved the touch of the billboard about somebody missing. Yes. Um, and that's a and, thing like you could easily miss. But if you catch it, it's like kind of connects it later on. Yeah, because I caught that when we you first did. went through it. And then later when they mentioned like, oh, people are going missing. I'm like, ha ha. He's down in the sewer. Yeah. yeah, there's something. There was something else. And I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. But somebody, there, there's something else in the background earlier on in the movie. I think or, um, it, it might have been like a newscast or something like that where somebody says that somebody else has gone missing. Mm-hmm. So I was like, Michael's been busy. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he throws him over there. The first thing that I noticed, and I had to go back like when I got home and you know, saw it on streaming and I had to like send screenshots to my friend. You see Michael before he actually gets pulled into the sewer. So when he goes over uh, the overpass and he lands and then uh, they take off, the camera comes down and on the left you see the the homeless guy yeah. Corey is in the middle of the frame on the ground and the camera pans very quickly but if you pause it you can see michael walking towards the frame walking towards Corey. oh my god and then he pulls him in there the the number one thing that i don't understand in this movie the like hardcore the only thing that i genuinely don't get i have no explanation for okay is not at this part never mind oh. <laughs> it's later out of the movie, but it, you had me on we'll edge Oh we'll my get god. Um, okay. Yeah. But um I loved the whole thing with being in the sewer. Yeah. And when Corey sees him, the it, it's pretty much established in well, in a way, that he gains strength yeah. from mm -hmm. killing. Mm -hmm. And I would assume that 
with the homeless guy saying like every now and then he'll pull people in there, but they don't come back out. Yeah. I'm assuming that's supposed to be like, he's able to pick on the weak ones to a point that gives him enough strength to stay alive still. Yeah. But not to be like the Michael, like swole Michael that we know of. <laughs> but I, 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 I genuinely liked, th- this is the most supernatural part of it that they don't give you an explanation for. Cause it's mm-hmm. like, did he possess Corey? That's not my interpretation he needed Corey. He he saw in Corey the ability to infect him because that's also something that they repeat time and time again in this movie is the word infection. Yeah. Yes. He infects Corey and eventually starts following Corey around because Corey is going to bring him more victims and allow him to beef himself up a little bit. So yeah. I did like that. And I, I, and I don't know if I haven't really seen a lot of people talking about this, but to me, the whole thing with the sewer and him needing to spread fear in his victims, that was very it to me. Oh, yeah. I mean, because I'm like, that's like, I've read the novel it as well. Yeah. And I'm like, that's very much so what the novel is talking about with Pennywise. Like the townspeople act different and behave different and like, Pennywise doesn't always even have to fucking come out of the sewers. Like he interacts with people and then they go and they start killing people and acting crazy. And I'm like, that's what Michael is doing. Yeah. Um, I I completely agree with that. And it kind of goes hand to hand with also like the townspeople ostracizing a certain person and being like horrible bullies to them and doing something kind of similar, like in like the beginning of it or like uh, one of the chapters that I want to say like it's early on in the, in the book. Uh, but if you saw the movies, it's like the beginning of after ch- chapter two, um, where, you know, like they target somebody and then the it entity grabs or Pennywise grabs uh, one of the victims. So I definitely see the it comparison. Um, but I also felt like it gave me like Halloween, the beginning of five, Halloween five vibes where there is like uh, like a homeless man who does like assist Michael at the beginning of that movie. I know you mm-hmm. haven't seen Halloween five, but I'm spoiling it for you right now. Um, but Halloween five, I mean, we also have that Michael does live underneath in Halloween resurrection. Um, mm-hmm. So it's like a similar plot point. Um, it's this whole scene right now where they're like, he's passing whatever infection is to Corey is very referential to the other installments as well. Cause I feel like we've, we've seen some sort of, similar thing before yeah and like so for me i think the just the very fact that Corey fell off of the bridge onto the area below is almost like referencing the fact that this whole movie started with him accidentally uh, i mean the the kid accidentally falling over the railing and everyone blaming him and that like this is sort of like that same thing happens to him, but he, he almost, instead of being the person that now the town hates and he was just trying to like say, this wasn't my fault to embracing that mantle of, you know what? I will go and kill people. And I think that that was like sort of that little push that he needed for Michael to be able to infect him. Cause I like, I like your point, Nick, that evil is almost like a, a force all on its own that, can infect people and, and that mm-hmm. everyone has that that capacity within themselves to to do what Michael did to people. And you know I do I do like that that happened where Michael took him in. I'm not gonna get into the whole thing about Michael living in the sewers and where are the bodies and whatever. <laughs> I I like that he immediately like went right out after he left the sewers and just like the first thing that happened was he killed the homeless guy. Uh, not that I like that he killed the homeless guy. I just think that it was it was good at representing that like this switch is flipped in him and he's now different from where he was before. Um, I I'm still a little iffy about Michael actually living in the sewers the whole time, but at least this is better than resurrection because this is like an actual sewer that he like made himself a hole in the wall instead of being just like this mysterious tunnel with a gate that somehow exists in this suburban neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you seen the Rob Zombie ones? I have only seen the first one, not the second. Yeah, not well... Rob Zombie. Rob Zombie two. <laughs> uh, so Rob Zombie's Halloween two. I am a apologist for that because I love that movie. Oh. But I will say, um, 
you if if you are unsure of how you feel about Michael's betrayal with being in the sewer and stuff like that, uh, buckle up for <laughs> Rob Zombie's <laughs> Halloween too. I will just say that because it is <sighs> like people are like, this isn't Michael talking about Halloween ends. Rob Zombie's Halloween two is the least Michael Myers version of. Michael oh yeah, Myers, I mean, th- I I haven't seen it in forever i went to go see that in theaters but i honestly forget the plot but i remember it being out there yeah i mean he's not even basically dressed as michael myers he's feeding off of wildlife yeah Uh, uh, he's like a homeless and has a big beard like (laughs) it's it's different. <laughs> well, I don't necessarily have an issue with him living in the sewers. I just feel like it raises more questions than answers because now you have to figure out, like, what was he doing for four years? I mean, sure, every once in a while he was, like, bringing somebody in. And maybe you make the argument that there's something supernatural, that he doesn't really need food to survive. He just needs to be able to keep killing people. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I, I heard some other people being like, I don't get it. Why is he so weak now? Like, why, why can't... I feel bad. I'm like making a voice. Um, but like, why are people do, uh, making, why are they making Michael Myers so weak? But I mean, at the end of Kills, he was weak. He, they, they brought him down. They, you know, but also he did kill a ton of people at the same time. <laughs> it's, it's, the reality of it is, like I said earlier, they were figuring this shit out as they went along. They did yeah. not go into this with a clear cut story and approach. Like they, they were writing it as you know okay it's time to write the next movie and they're like all right let's figure out what the fuck we want to do um it is the, i mean i understand the questioning yeah. of it because if he's suppo- like if he's supposed to be powering up when he kills we yeah. literally watch him power up like like he is having the and world's strongest everybody. orgasm in this movie <laughs> when he kills that cop in the sewer oh my like, god we yes. saw him kill those podcast people in 2018 and he hadn't killed anybody in 40 years and we didn't see him uh, jo- you know yeah convulsing like that, that. Is... so i like i get it so the, the, my thing is i view halloween ends as i know who these characters are but i'm going to present pretend like i'm not going to look at the pr- prior movies yeah for explanations and reasonings for why what is happening in this movie is happening yeah because it feels like like there's a little bit of it touched on where she sends, says at the end of kills, like each time he kills, he transcends. Mm-hmm. So I would, if I had to kind of create an explanation for it in my head, I would say he's probably been living in the sewers because he did sustain a fuck ton of damage throughout 2018 and kills. Yeah. And him killing those people on the street were, was probably enough to get him up and get him away. Yeah. And then killing, randomly pulling people discreetly into the sewer was enough to keep him going until eventually something came along that was going to be his path out. So Corey and Allison go on a dinner date, um, but Allison's ex-boyfriend, police officer Doug Mulaney, uh, Mulaney? Mulaney. 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 There we go. Thank you. Shows up and harasses them both. Um, This also goes to show that Allison has been through like with another guy and obviously he's a pretty skeevy guy so it did not work out uh so she hasn't had much luck um cory later lures the cop into the sewer michael emerges and kills doug to cory's delight now this scene is wild <laughs> i was here for it i was here mm-hmm. for it it's wild the, be- uh, because one i don't know if you got this maybe i'm i have a a, a gutter mind or whatever the saying is but the way that he is put, he uh, Corey's positioning the cop, and the way that Michael is stabbing, and the way that Corey's just looking at Michael in the eyes, it's just like I was like, <laughs> it was it was bottom energy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, like I was I was genuinely waiting for like the, the, to show the blood splashing on Corey's face. Oh my like, god. I, the shot this is this is some fraternity x right here <laughs> i just couldn't like i couldn't help it just like the idea of just like the knife th- the idea of penetration and the way that he like was looking at him it was just so sensual 
Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. But I don't. I don't hate it. I was just thought it was wild to see. Uh, yeah, which... I mean, I don't know if it was intentional, but I mean, they always do kind of say like when, when and not just in Halloween. I'm just talking about in general when you hear about people talking about evil and the concept of evil. Like they talk about how it's seductive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Evil is seductive, so it made sense within the scene. Yeah, and of course, we do have a little bit of uh, gyrating Michael when he like does power up. He does the. <laughs> <laughs> I was gagged. It was hilarious when he did that. Well, Cody was so confused because Cody was like, "What's happening?" It was like he's getting stronger in front of our eyes. <laughs> mm-hmm. He was raising that power meter. Um, <laughs> did you catch that? Like that? That the cop Mulaney? That's that little bastard that was picking on what's his face in the beginning of Halloween kills during the flashback, the little kids that are picking on what's his face. Oh. Don't fuck with the Mulaney's. Jesus Christ. Wow. Mm-hmm. See, I like that. I like that little like That's tie what around. Should have done with Corey. Mm-hmm. Have him sprinkled somewhere else in there. Um, yeah. But this scene, now that we're here, this is the scene that I was talking about when they go, when he goes into the sewer. Yeah. And he sees something, like he's like looking at something on the wall. Michael's face, not, I'm not talking about Michael being next, like just out of sight of the frame. Yeah. His face is literally etched into the fucking stone. And I don't understand what that was about. <laughs> I don't understand it. <laughs> I, one of my, one of my friends, he is a super huge Halloween fan like me. Like literally his like, leg is Michael Myers' face. Uh, I reached out to him and I said, look, I love this movie, but the face and the stone, he goes, that's the only thing I haven't fucking figured out. I don't know what that is. He got he got bored and decided to do some self-portraits. Yeah, he that's... knows how to camouflage himself into the into things now. Um, I can't tell you. I can't tell you what, what that might have been, but I did notice that. Yeah. I just figured maybe, maybe it was just supposed to be a very, very, very loose like reference to Halloween six, like with cults and druids and yeah. they were living underground and, and, uh, and they had the big stone altar and shit. I just figured maybe that was just like a, a little nod to, not to it. Um, or is it supposed to be like that thing where like you see Jesus in a piece of toast? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Actually, actually Sergio, you'll know this cause you've seen this movie. It might be a reference to Halloween three. Cause like what was behind everything in Halloween three? What were they worshiping? It was made of stone. <laughs> oh yes, I think it might be an homage. I, again, I, do, I don't want. I don't want to spoil anything. Yeah, that because <laughs> that you'll be like, what the fuck would you watch that for? <laughs> I, I honestly, I mean, that is deep. If they did go for that, because I'm like, all right, hooray for you guys. So Allison is passed over for a promotion at work in favor of a fellow nurse who is having an affair with the doctor. I almost forgot about these characters. Um, I actually really loved uh, this scene where, like, the girl comes over. She's like, mm, it's like, uh, I really thought that you were going to get the promotion. I don't know, like, what happened. And then Allison is like, do you ever shut up? She's like, I know, right? And just, like, keeps going. Completely out of touch. Completely out of touch. I love her hair, though. I feel like oh, she has yeah. just, like, wonderful, like, red hair. So the the doctor is the the doctor's party was the one that um the nurse and doctor couple from the first one and second one yeah they were going to his party and then when we are introduced to that couple again in the bar and kills and she's complaining about the dr mathis yeah yeah. Matheson was being inappropriate that's him oh. and it makes sense given how, what we see of him and oh yeah, yeah. totally <laughs> makes sense wow we we're we're failing at catching these references mm-hmm. oh my god Don't no worry, that's awesome you. So Corey then kills the doctor at his home while the nurse is killed by Michael. How how did you like this whole entire scene? It was everything. It was everything. The house was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. It was like seven. It was very seventies. Yeah, I loved the house, and I loved. So they had a couple of different touches in here that I really really liked. So I liked when the nurse we'll call her nurse i don't remember what her name is uh she when she first walks outside after she hears the doctor yell Mm -hmm. i heard like in the background and i'm like what is that and i saw i thought maybe it was like a plant that was blowing in the background when she first walks out because it's completely in the dark yeah i turned to my friend in the theater and i said is somebody getting stabbed 
like in the dark and she's like i don't know what that noise is and then it the lights turn on and he is just going to yes. town on him uh first and foremost i want that pumpkin scarecrow or that yeah that scarecrow mask that Corey has. yeah that's a, a great look and yeah i understand from a story perspective why it was important for him to eventually dress like michael at the end yeah but had they not killed him off spoiler alert had they not killed him <laughs> off at the end of the movie like i would have been down for that being like the new face it was oh, yeah. it was weirdly creepy but also very cool like it reminded me of the clown mask that michael originally wore like i feel like yeah. that was like his first mask and then went over to take over michael um yeah i i liked it i wish he it was around a lot more um because I, I thought it was pretty creepy. You thought it was pretty creepy. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, especially like it starts getting splattered with blood. And you, mm -hmm. It's a creepy mask. And I hate the idea of what you described about the stabbing. He was stabbing the doctor. Just like you know what's going on. And yeah, I overall, I hate stabbings because like Scream and also, you know, this trilogy, when people get stabbed, oh, I feel it. I like just in you. Uh, it gets me every yeah, time. I would say Corey, in regards to what you're talking about with the, like being kind of weirded out by stabs, Corey yeah. to me is very much Amber Freeman in oh, the way, yeah. like, it's not just like, like, you know, like if you think of like the first couple of screen movies or even, you know, everything with Michael Myers, like it's mm -hmm. very, um, there's like a theatricality yeah. and like a drama to the, like how, how they do it. Whereas like Amber and Corey are just like, going at it <laughs> and i'm just like chill the fuck out chill yeah, out like chill. in scream five i felt uncomfortable every time somebody was getting stabbed because it felt more realistic the way yeah. that they were doing it mm -hmm. and the way that Corey I and mean, he has the bag on the guy's head so he can't like scream out with oh it was terrifying it was it but was when he terrifying. Pins that, when he pins her to the wall though ooh, that was awesome I I also just like because I feel like we're 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 getting full Michael here. I feel like you know he's he's getting stronger, and she had no she had no chance. I was like, oh fuck fuck, this this is crazy. Oh, yeah. she was fucked. <laughs> she was and I don't know if if it was just from the way that they were filming it, but when he or or if the actress was like really really tiny, but he looks massive. Yeah. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. as compared to previous films, and I, like I got, uh, I got the chance to to meet him in real life, and he like in real life, and I'm sure like they put him in lifts and stuff, but like in real life, he was only like two or three inches taller than I. Yeah, and I'm I'm like five eleven, so I mean he's tall, but he's not as he looked like seven feet tall in that shot after yeah. he pins into the wall. And I I love this kill because it was kind of again it was it seemed very theatrical, and I feel like Michael Myers is known to you know be a little theatrical with his setups and uh kind of stalking and until he gets like the kill that he wants um i i like that i i like these kind of kills instead of like the cutaway kills and you know maybe it was um really quick but th this for me really did it for me along with chase scenes i i really love chase scenes and we do get a little bit of a chase scene later on with the with the other kids but um yeah this did it for me i liked it the um one uh, a nice touch that I liked with Corey's hand injury, yeah, is uh, Allison mentions multiple again with the whole infection thing when she keeps talking about his hand and not not to allow it to get infection, and then he takes he off takes the bandage off. and immediately sticks up his hand and says, "Show me how to do it." Like yeah. to me, that was supposed to convey he is just completely consumed by this now. Yeah, yeah, he's completely left. It stopped trying to. And it kind of made yeah. me sad because I feel like it really, it, it wasn't hard. It, it kind of just, he was such in a vulnerable state that it really took him. Um, and it's kind of sad in retrospect, just because it seemed like he was going for someone not as strong. Yeah, I mean, it, I, th I think Corey's character and what they were trying to convey with him is very sad to me because yeah. it's very reflective of society and, you know, talking about... Uh, how monsters are made are they born that way or uh, can we create them are they a product of their surroundings and mm -hmm. you know putting the supernatural thing with michael aside like yeah we don't understand why the fuck michael is the way that he is and i appreciate the fact that they still kept that ambiguous but like with Corey, Corey became a monster because 
society made him a monster. Yes. Yeah. And people always like, at least in my experience, people always like to view everything through a black and white lens. Like people are either good or they're bad. And that's not the case. Yeah. Anybody is capable of evil if pushed to the limit. Mm-hmm. And that is reflective in Corey. I think so. Wow, that was beautifully said. Oh my yeah. god. You got I know, me. I got real deep you right got there. Me. Oh my god. <laughs> Woo. I like don't even have any follow up. I nope, no follow up here. Nope. An unknowing Allison plans to leave Haddonfield with an insistent Corey because of the past trauma, while Laurie becomes increasingly suspicious of Corey. After finding him sleeping in the spot Jeremy died, Laurie offers to help him in the condition that he distanced himself from Allison. Cor retorts by blaming her for the events that have occurred in Haddonfield and says if he cannot have Allison, no one will. Which is kind of like mirroring the um, kind of manipulative, abusive tendencies, which I don't think it is him, but the evil has taken over at this point. Yeah, I, I hated this because... Uh, I mean, just because, like, that was just such abuser language to just be like, if I can't have her, nobody can. I've been like, I mean, first of all, you've been talking for what? Like, three days? (laughs) 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 Which Lori, you know, respectfully, she comes in and, like, yo, chill. Chill, like. Right. I think, think, uh, to your point, his whole thing with, if I can't have her, no one else can it feels like his mom. Yes. Like I feel like his mom was treating him the same way. And he's just obviously doing a much more grand version of it with Mm -hmm. Allison. But I do, um, when, when, (laughs) when Lori sees him watching her outside of the window, I love that. And I love, I don't know how the fuck they did this. His little jump scare where he like randomly appears behind. Yeah. He's like, hello. (laughs) <laughs> uh, uh, that was great too but his or uh, uh, Lori's reaction the way that they framed that and the and and like you just hear the score and it's slightly slowed down and it, like the second that she saw his eyes she was like oh yes <laughs> no yeah. she caught on she caught on real quick which I like that they didn't you know dumb down Lori any bit even though she was effective and you know going through therapy she was still on like on her toes when this stuff happens mm-hmm. yep. yeah and this actually th- this part of our summary i think skips over the part where laurie is at the bar and jeremy's dad explains how he yes. ran into him on the street and he was gonna like just just say something to, to like forgive him basically and because he, I, I mean, I loved the line where he said, I felt like everyone was taking my trauma and making it theirs. Mm-hmm. That like, that that really hit me. But I also really liked how it, how he said, like, when I saw his eyes, there was just mm-hmm. nothing behind them, which was a, a good callback to what Dr. Loomis says about Michael mm-hmm. in the original movie. Right. That that's actually one of my favorite lines in the movie is or like that whole conversation, but specifically mm-hmm. like with people taking his pain and trying to make it theirs. Like it's very much so like with the bullies that throw him over the the overpass. It yeah. like he didn't kill your little brother. Like he, he he was cleared legally, although you we all know that that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Yeah. Um, he was cleared <laughs> legally. Everyone, you know, his story is that it was an accident. Yeah. But people are acting insane towards him to the point where they're literally willing to kill him and throw him over a bridge. Yeah. And it's like, it's not your pain. It's not your grief. So what the fuck are you, like, shut up. (laughs) And the fact that he recognizes that and it's like, it does nothing good. It pisses me off that they're doing that yeah. you know i love that he recognizes that even though he had a very different tone with um with cory himself in the beginning like he was right just very like absent-minded with him um but you know this whole scene was great um i wonder how other people who aren't a fan of this movie take this whole aspect of putting cory and the parents trauma front and center you know right i'm 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 very curious um to like learn because we don't see the parents together Mm -hmm. again we just see them one instance each separately when the mom goes crazy at Corey at the bar yeah and then the dad and and like 
I think it's a good look at like how different people deal with grief. Yeah. Uh, like the mom went with anger and she couldn't move on, which is very Lori in 2018. Ooh, Whereas yeah. the dad, like he was sad and he accepted it and he was forgiving of it. And to me, that is very Lori in Halloween ends. Oh yeah. yeah. That, that, those are which good is parallels. why I think like, she was able to uh, i think that's why they gave lori the scene with the dad yeah. versus lori having a scene with jeremy's mom on october 31st Corey returns to the sewers and successfully fights michael for his mask now <laughs> we're gonna pause here because i feel like this was the moment where i audibly said people are going to be mad or people are going to be upset because we see very a la Halloween Resurrection, Buster Rhymes, Ninja kicking every like Michael Myers down. Um, it 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 was that moment where someone overpowered Michael and made him look weak and like shitty, um, which I totally get. I get people are not gonna like like that, but I feel like it was for a purpose. He needed to fulfill that because he is also stronger. Well, I took that as like he wants to take on this persona because he wants to get revenge on society so much that he's like, this is how I do it. But honestly, and I said this in the reaction, it reads to me almost like a shitty training montage where like you see him like he like he's pushing We're on Michael wrestling. and then Michael pushes him back and then he's overpowering Michael. I'm just <laughs> like, we didn't need this. It wasn't necessary. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not bothered by it, but I don't necessarily think that we needed to see it on screen. Like it would have been like maybe not even necessarily needing to tussle with Michael. Like he could have just went in there and grabbed the, the mask. Although I guess it would have begged the question of why didn't Michael have the mask on? Yeah. But I think one, one thing that's very half-assed, I guess you could say, and doesn't make a lot of sense, is what they're trying to convey with Michael's mask in this trilogy. Because in 2018, it's implied that, like, it's all about the mask. But, like, when yeah. the podcaster is like, you can feel it, and simply him holding the mask out is enough to get all of the other patients riled up. And even the moment and that he, like, puts it on, we have this whole scene where he puts mm -hmm. it on. It's, like, meant to be something. Right, so I did. I don't quite grasp what they're trying to convey with the mask, but uh. um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm indifferent towards that scene. I don't love it, but I don't. It doesn't like bother me. But I can see why other people wouldn't like it. I don't think that people need to go fucking crazy over it like they are. Petition. But. Oh, also, let's let's talk about the petition. Um, so there is a petition currently going on. I don't know if it's still going on, but I've heard that someone has created a petition for the filmmakers to remake this movie. Um, and Cody made a reference before. I was like, if there, if there was a petition made, it's there's other movies that should have been remade. Yeah. I think what right. I said is that if Halloween resurrection is still out there, the way that it is, this movie can also <laughs> stay the way that it is. Uh, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's embarrassing. Like I would be embarrassed to be one of those people who signed it. I would be embarrassed to be the person who made it. I need to see like, the names. First of all, how much was a, a, a budget of $20 million? Where the mm. fuck do you think that they're just supposed to pull it out of their ass? Where are they yeah. going to get $20 million to remake the movie? And it's, it's, it's just the entitled toxic fan, you know, that we've, we've, within the last, you know, 10 years that we've just seen the rise of where yes. we, we see them in all of the fandoms, mm -hmm. uh, they act crazy and, and it's, it's just entitlement and it's a concept that I don't grasp because as much as I love this franchise, uh, you know, I didn't like Halloween kills. I mean, well, yeah. I like it, but I like, you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's not my favorite. And to, to sit there and go, this is not my Halloween movie. Okay, so it's not your Halloween movie. Move on. It's yeah. a movie. You're watching somebody else's vision of what they think is cool. And if you don't like it, that's fine. There is, what, 12 other fucking movies to go and exactly. watch. Exactly. This is a pick-your-own-adventure franchise. Like yeah. You can literally go back and watch the version that you like and the timeline that you like, um, which is totally fair. But I do have to give props to Scream 5 um, for calling this out and how many people were like oh that's not a believable thing but like it is i mean you're seeing it right now like you know scream five you had 
spoiler if you haven't seen it, but like had killers who decided that they wanted a movie uh, better, a new a new entry. So they took it upon themselves to do that and create a story. And now we're getting a petition for people to remake this movie. Like, come on. Right. Guys. It's like, it's just, there's no self-awareness. They have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> like, they're... They, that movie was talking about all of them. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's that behavior. Exactly. And it's, like, it's like like the same people where uh that complain about Halloween 2 and introducing the sibling angle. It ruins Halloween. Halloween 1978 is still there. It didn't go anywhere. <laughs> right I there. never understand this this whole thing where yeah, the sequels ruined it. Yeah. No, because the fucking movie is still there. Just don't watch the sequels if you don't like the sequels. Exactly. Also, girl that movie came out in like 1981. Come on, we're in 2022. Click, let it go. Let it go. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, respectfully for anybody out there who is is watching. Meanwhile, Lori and Allison argue as she plans to leave, and Allison too blames Lori for Michael's actions. Uh, Can I say something about this real quick? Because mm-hmm. I wanted to mention earlier in the movie, and I didn't have a chance. This felt like almost too real for me because of course everyone blames Laurie for Michael coming after her. Like it, uh, both the DJ and somebody else literally said like, you teased this guy. Like, no, she you provoked didn't. him. You provoked like, like he, he picked her out of nowhere and just like obsessed over her and killed all of her friends and tried to kill her. But like, she did nothing to provoke this. It's almost like, you know, the, the idea that like, women shouldn't dress a certain way or it compels other people to do things that are like not yeah. good. And I think, I mean, technically I feel like the podcasters kind of had a hand in that, but uh, I, I do think that, yeah, Michael Myers was going to do this regardless. Mm-hmm. Like he was going to continue killing, but I do think that Lori was like the face of it all. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I think the, the Corey's mom says it to Lori when she goes to visit and she says, your boogeyman disappeared, so the town needed a new one, and they picked Corey. And it's like t- technically the person to blame is Michael Myers. Yeah, mm-hmm. for one. Now, if you needed somebody else to blame other than Michael Myers, Doctor Sartain. Oh yes, he's you're literally right. the one that orchestrated everything. And no, he stood his name by and watched the podcasters. Right, yeah. stood by and watched the podcasters attempting to provoke a, a reaction. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I mean, I like narratively, I understand it though because Sartain is gone, the podcasters are gone, Michael has disappeared, and they're anger they're they're angry and they don't have a resolution. Yeah, and they don't know where Michael is, so there's only you know, one person to go to yeah. is to blame it on Lori, but also there's this other kid who is rebellious and had something awful happen. So obviously, they're going to ostracize anybody that they can. Um, right. But this scene. I loved. I thought their acting abilities in, in this scene together were great. I think they still had chemistry. Um, I liked it. And I love that we were getting more of the trauma that Allison had in this movie. Um, so that was that was good. And it was heartbreaking the way that she like yelled at her. I was like, oh. Yeah, I I I, I really like Andy Matichek and I I don't mind the character of Allison. It's just like this is a moment and it's not like a moment that would make you like Allison. Like I understand yeah. why she's saying what what she's saying, but this was like the first time we're with the meat and the potatoes. This is the first time <laughs> I feel like they actually gave her something to do yes. other than just be in scenes and react to what's going on around her. Mm-hmm. She carried the scene in my opinion. So this, You're yeah, right. this was a really strong scene for me. You're right. So that night, Corey embarks on a rampage, murdering the bullies after luring them to the salvage yard and accidentally killing his father a stepfather this is where we get a good amount of kills we get our bullies back in uh back in action uh they're kind of ready to fight him because i think he etched like he scratched psycho on into his car hood. into his car hood mm-hmm. yeah so they went back and were like all pumped up chest like we're, we're ready for you and they were not ready for what's happening we got one of the one of the guys who was killed in the car off screen and acting here i mean the main 
the main bully, right? The one who has the varsity jacket on, um, who also happens to have the same colors as Woodsboro High for some reason. I guess they're I like, caught that too. You got, you got that? I was like, I don't, yeah. are, are they like, okay, um, that's fine. But um, he also has like this Italian accent or like New, New York City Italian accent, which I always thought was funny because it seemed a little out of place, but maybe it makes sense. But he... His acting is a little iffy for me in this scene. Just because I always find it funny when he's like, she's dead. He's dead. I just felt it was a little much. <laughs> it's 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 hard for me because I haven't, like, I didn't get to see him doing anything outside of basically this one. He has one emotion. And it's basically, oh, shit, or I want to murder people. Yeah. Um, but I wonder... To your point, <laughs> oh, no. if he is, if he, if it's a uh, an Emma Roberts type situation, where there's a reason that she plays that specific type of role all the time, because that is a role that she excels at, and that's fine. <laughs> and then when you see her outside of that role, at least for me, I haven't yeah. seen her entire filmography or anything like that. Um, but I'm just like. Be a bitch again. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't see her as anything other than these, you know, iconically bitchy characters that she's played. Yeah. So I feel like this, the, whoever the actor is in this, mm -hmm. I'd be curious to see him in other stuff to see what, like, yeah. the range. But in this one, I just, like, he played the role very well when he was being angry. When he was a dick. Because mm -hmm. it, was, like it was an acer. Yeah, I totally get it. And now you've gotten me thinking, like, what other Emma Roberts roles where she played like down to earth? Like <laughs> she had something except she for her like movies. What, yeah, Palo Alto. She had a movie where she. I don't really remember if she. Everybody in that movie was kind of trashy, <laughs> so it's entirely possible she was too. Which is why I'm not picking up. And then there was some other movie where she's like in a psychiatric. Unit. Yes, but see, she can, I, she's always played some sort of deranged, damaged yeah but hey she knows i feel like she's she's an actress who knows her shtick and plays it well yeah. and does it and that's yeah. completely fine and i love that mm -hmm. um, yeah i think people always try to have they're like why can't they play other types of roles what does it matter yeah i just <laughs> love seeing what her... they play and they play it well then there you go exactly one like i i love this scene because of the minor chase scene that we get which is i think her name is margo it, 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 she was the nicer one of the group and try to like help Corey a little bit but she runs away from the car because i believe Corey is in the car um very reference to like christine uh just a little bit but i also kind of got halloween five vibes as well because there is a car chase scene in that one where daniel harris is running away from michael um, and she hops the fence. <laughs> he runs over the fence and she just lays out flat. <laughs> the minute yes. that she plopped, I was like, oh my God. I, I laughed. I, I mean, know I'm supposed to be scared, but I can't help it. I can't get over the fact that like she's, she somehow gets under the fence, even though she was on the truck side of the fence, wasn't she? No, she's she was she had just gotten oh, over. Oh, she had just gotten over, right? Still, so, yeah. you get the weight of this tow truck on the fence, and she's just under there like, Yeah, I'm fine. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, for me it was the fact that they see the truck, the like the headlights turn on. Mm-hmm. And they just run directly straight in front of it. You Everybody said that. that I've watched mm -hmm. this with is like, why didn't they just go <laughs> yeah, left or right? Serpentine. There are aisles. You can go down it easily. You don't even have to like climb up on top of a car. And he couldn't exactly. follow you. Exactly. But yes, to your point, I think um, this was. I was thinking Halloween Five as well. I also got like with the tow truck and running, th like crashing through something was giving me a little bit of Halloween Four with <gasps> the gas station. Oh yes, yes, yes. You're right. Um, yeah, so I think it was supposed to be like all of those things. I like it. I, I like those little references because I, I didn't pick it up at the moment. But thinking back on it, I was like, oh, that's really nice. He's paying um, homage to other entries. Um, and I, it kind of makes me at the same time, it makes me kind of pay respect to David Gordon Green. And oh, my God, I forgot his name. What's the other writer? Uh, uh, Danny McBride. Yeah, Danny McBride, because 
I feel like they've done their research and they they genuinely love the the franchise, uh, which is a shame that people you know shit on it because I think they really do like Halloween as you know art. Yeah, I, I think the, the way that I would view them is uh, they are massive fans of the Halloween franchise. They just don't always have a clear cut vision of what they want to do. It's kind of like when you're like, okay, I want to make a sequel to uh scream five or something like that yeah and you want to do it in a way but like oh i want to make it very similar to scream two where it felt more grounded and the gore wasn't insanely over the top blah 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 blah. you want to do something one way but then you kind of like start to throw in other little tidbits and, and shit from other stuff that ultimately starts to affect the vision that you're trying to get across and yeah. I feel like they, there, there, there was too many. What, what is the term? Too many cookies in the jar? No, <laughs> too many hands in the in the cookie jar or something like that. Too you many know? cooks. Too many cooks in the kitchen. Too... Yeah, it was like there, there was too many ideas going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. You got to learn to trim the fat a little bit. Well, I, I think you said this before too. Is that like I think there w- you could see a vision there, but it was just buried mm-hmm. with all these other things. Unfortunately, it right. just got it just got lost in the in the sauce. I, I, I don't know phrases today. I'm just going to go with that. Um, the the only one that I would say that, I mean, I guess, I guess we didn't need it, but uh, the one friend that gets killed off screen, I would have preferred that one to stay on screen. There were yeah. a lot of off screen kills. Not a lot. Like, not as many as Halloween 2018, but this one, we got a good balance of it. I, obviously, I prefer, I don't mind gore. I'm a pretty fan of gore. So um, I, I think the off-screen kill of, of the, who was it? The girl? I forgot her name. Mm-hmm. I don't know her name, unfortunately. Um, but you know the, the girl, the, the yeah. other one. Um, so she she got hit with a wrench, I think. Yeah, she gets bludgeoned with the wrench. The main idiot gets the blowtorch down the mouth. The other one. I think I think maybe maybe not the, the one that got bludgeoned. Maybe that would be fine off screen. But I feel like the, the other guy that he finds in the car, he was a dick enough that that should have... Like, we needed catharsis with that. Yeah. We should have seen him die on screen. But the other one, I'm fine with. But uh, then, you know, then he smashes that other chick's face. Under oh, the my God. I literally was just like, okay, she's good. She's safe. No. Yeah. He, it's very like the same thing that he did to... Um, Dr. Sartine, Sartain, right? Mm-hmm. Like just guts, his head just explodes. Um, yep. Really, really funny for me. And yeah, just the scene the, with the with the blowtorch. Is that is that what's called? Mm-hmm. Blowtorch. You don't you don't have to see it fully. It's blurry because we're focused on Margot's reaction. She's just staring at it. She's just I staring at him getting his mouth just like on like in flames. Um, and we don't see an aftermath. It's, it's similar to the whole uh, scene with uh, what was her, Sandra, like in the neck, and then the husband, mm-hmm. like because for a, a, a part of that shot, you're seeing it. You're just watching her have to react to watching her husband be used like a fucking pin cushion. Yeah. Um, so I, I can see like the similarities there with mm-hmm. how they shot that, um, and I really really like that. Oh, <gasps> oh, it's my cat theater <laughs> it's yeah. like, i was like i don't um, think that's on our end uh-uh. oh, what was the other thing i was gonna oh yeah that's what i was gonna mention i'm very very curious to see who was actually underneath the costume uh whether that that was actually ro ro oh my god now you got me confused oh. rohan rohan i'm so Corey. sorry mr mr campbell um please forgive us Mr. Sexy Lips. Uh, whoever, <laughs> I don't know if he was. Under he does that, have but... pouty lips. Did you like? He does do the, like the the pouty mm-hmm. lips pretty well. He goes. He goes. Oh, David is gonna uh, make fun of me because I don't know if you watched his reaction to it yet. But he, as soon as he pops, all oh, y'all white people are about to simp over yeah, this man. No. <laughs> um, it's okay. It's but okay. but the the way like when he gets out of the car that sh- when they follow him. He gets out of the car and he walks around it as he's holding the wrench. The way that he is moving is exactly how Nick Castle moved as Michael in the original yeah. film. And I love James Jude Courtney. I like this is a fantastic version of Michael Myers, the way that he played him. Mm-hmm. But like even in the flashback in Kills to 78, 
no offense to that man, he did fine, whoever was playing the younger version, but he didn't walk like Nick Castle. Yeah. This, uh, Corey, whoever, well, assuming that was Corey in the costume, mm. like, he walked just like Nick Castle. I love it. It would be awesome if they did just, like, well, uh, I don't know if he has the, the same frame as uh, a Michael. I have to kind of, like, go back and kind of really study that part, but it would be awesome if he, they kind of gave him that cameo mm -hmm. to, to, mm -hmm. to portray it as Michael. Um, and then we have the death of the stepfather, and this was accidentally, and this happens actually before the the, the two other other kids. Um, so the bully, the one with the varsity jacket, uh, has a gun and shoots it. And at the last minute, he one he sees that um, he sees Michael, but he doesn't. Does he have his mask off? I don't think he has he, the mask on at that point. He doesn't have the mask on, I think. No, he yeah, he, he doesn't put on the mask until after the dad gets killed. So he sees Corey um there. So I like those moments are always so sad for me because it's just like he only has a little bit of time to process what's going on. And then he sees that it's it's Corey and he he might be doing it. Why is he here? What is he is he causing harm? And then sees a gun and he decides to like go in its way. Go and the way of the bullet so it doesn't hit Corey. And I just thought, like, that says so much of his character and how much mm -hmm. he cared for Corey. And it's just so sad. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was a genuinely upsetting death, in my yeah. opinion. On the other spectrum, we don't get to see the death of the mom. So they do, they did film that because in the trailer, there's shots of it and then there's promo images of her, like, bloodied up, like, holding his arm. So oh, they okay. Did okay. That. So it'll, I'm assuming that'll probably be one of the deleted scenes that are on the. Yeah, I kind of want to see that. I feel like she was another character that I feel like we should have seen the death to. Oh, yeah. She was... Gr yes. <laughs> she was gross. Um, he then goes on to kill his mother and as well as a DJ at a local radio station who taunted him earlier. Boy! My favorite kill of the whole movie. Of the whole movie, everybody <laughs> in my theater was gagged, <gasps> they were cheering. I was, and my yes. friends, I, I went with two friends, they both were like, holy shit. <laughs> I loved when he kills that guy. This kill was fun. I, Cause I was not expecting it to be that wild, that gruesome, and it didn't end. There were several, you could break this down. So he comes right behind him, grabs his head, starts slamming it down on the table, table, right? Not the record player. I, yeah, I think it was the it was the table. It was the table, mm -hmm. table. You see it. You you don't cut away. You're just seeing full on this kill. And as it goes on, his jaw opens up, and you just see blood. And Cody turned away during this moment. Mm -hmm. I feel bad because I kind of tricked him and said like, "Oh wait, you're missing something." <laughs> and that was the part where then he grabs a scissor and cuts off his tongue. Oh my god! And then <laughs> it's going then around it's just like... on the record, and it, it, like, and I don't think like people like uh, pick up on this, but like everybody that was listening could hear it because Alice. It, it, it cuts directly to the next scene of Allison getting out of the car, and she looks down at the radio, and you can hear it on <gasps> the radio. It's yeah, it's live on air. air. Yeah. Oh mother. Yeah, because that's something I noticed in my rewatch today is that like. When it cuts to the next scene, it's not like you can hear it through the radio that like what is being broadcast is the skip as the tongue gets around on the record and like pushes the needle up off of the record. Oh, my God. Amazing. My favorite um, death. I And it seems so practical. And I, I just practical effects of the shit. There, the I'm assuming she was 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 the front desk person. Was she supposed to be dressed as like Severina? I don't know. I don't think so because she gave me kind of like 1950s, like I don't know, some 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 woman from the 1950s for some I, reason. The way that they like the the way that they approached that scene, it felt to me like like there was some supposed to be something significant about it. Either that like maybe she was introduced, she would have been introduced earlier in the movie in a scene that's now deleted, or like it felt like either we were supposed to know her or we were supposed to know like uh, like whatever she was well, dressed up as. It, she is, uh, it is a cameo, so she is um, from the the co host to Joe Bob's. Um, uh, I forgot that it's the show on Shutter. Um, Joe Bob's something. I Joe always Bob 
Briggs. Joe Bob Briggs. Yeah, something. It's like I, a watch along. It's a or popular something. thing, but I don't. I'm not familiar with. She her. she is she is part of that. So she she's like big in the horror community. So that that was a that was a um cameo for her. I heard that actually the, her scene was longer and they cut it down. So I think that it might be a deleted scene later on that we probably see her death a little bit more. So at the Strode house, Lori Foe attempts suicide to lure Corey to her, whom she shoots down the stairs. Now we do have this whole setup. Did you at all think that this was a possibility that she was actually gonna do? No, I, I did not. But the thing that I didn't grasp is I don't, like faking her suicide to get him into the position where she could shoot him and he would fall over the railing because that specifically seemed intentional because she raises the gun to her head but then she moves out of frame yeah so it was obvious that she was specifically trying to position him in a shot to get him to go over the balcony mm -hmm. but i didn't understand what the purpose of her actually calling 911 and reporting a suicide it covered her ass later when he did actually kill himself but that's beside the point I didn't really get it. <laughs> I didn't really understand true. how she like and I rewatched it today and I tried to pay attention to the scene. I don't know how the fuck she knew that he was in her house. Because you're talking I, about like timing wise, like I, like I didn't like I felt like maybe they would have given us like a creaking door or like something to indicate that somebody else was there. But like when I watched it both times, all that I got from the scene is that Lori has this superpower for knowing when there is someone in her house and <laughs> being able to do some like really dramatic, did you really think I was going to kill myself line before shooting them? Uh, so I have to, uh, this popped into my head earlier, actually, this question. Um, I have to look it up because I'm fairly certain that when before she goes upstairs when she's downstairs she's like i think she like she like locks or she does something to the front door i think and i think it's supposed yeah. to be that she's locking it but i think she's unlocking it because she oh. wa she walks into the living room and she looks out the window and you don't see what she's looking at but she just pauses and she's just kind of looking out the window. So I think it was similar to when she saw him earlier. I think she saw him outside yeah. unlock the front door to allow him to come in, which is why later on when she looks over and she sees that the side door is open and she knows that that's not the way that he came in, yeah. that Michael is in the house. But I could be wrong. But I, I would believe that because she had already picked up on the fact that, you know, she obviously knows that Corey's out there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if she had or was privy to the what's been going on. Uh, like the killings that have been going on recently. Um, but I I do believe that she would have been able to spot somebody seeing her outside. I think she I think she, it's not a superpower, but I think she's very, very trained herself to know when when Michael is around or uh, Michael entity. Oh, she had 40 years. Yeah, I mean, and look how easily like as soon as she saw him earlier after he had his interaction with Michael, she immediately clocked that something was wrong. And I think I think it was like she, I think she knew that he was going to be coming for her in general. Yes, it exactly. was Halloween. Mm -hmm. He was stalking her outside. And then she had the conversation inside Jeremy's old house or whatever, where he was like, like, you know, if I can't have her, nobody can. So I think she knew for a fact that he was going to to come after her. So she like set all of that up. But I think I, I'm will 100 percent be going back and looking at that scene again because i'm fairly certain that's what she does now question uh well one i kind of wish that this scene wasn't in the trailer for some reason mm -hmm. i i kind of feel like it would have been a better i mean i still was gagged and i still was like yes like of course she's not gonna like commit suicide and i don't think that was the line that she said in the trailer when that happened um when they opened the door and she's like there with the gun um, I think it was something else that she said, but I just wish it there's wasn't... two different lines in the trailer that are not in it. Cause she's at one point when she's like, like she's hiding and he's approaching, she says in the trailer, I think she says, come and get me motherfucker. Yeah, exactly. I, I think she said something like that. And in this one, she was like, did you really think that I would, uh, kill myself um, well because also in the trailer it follows him for literally what oh yeah because in the trailer he goes in through the front door because they don't show that in the movie yes mm -hmm. yes 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 so there you go yeah so okay go, there we go oh <laughs> we, we did it we did we did it team we figured it out, we figured it out. Um, <laughs> Fletcher, who? 
so yes yeah, so she shoots him down the stairs um i have here Corey then stabs himself in the neck to frame laurie for his death in front of the arriving allison Are we gagged? Did we feel bad? I mean, I don't um, know that I felt bad. I was I, I was surprised that this is what happened, though. I don't know why Laurie then picked up the knife uh, just in time for well, Allison to walk in. Everybody screams, don't touch the knife, that I've yeah, watched reactions like, to it. In the theater, people were like, no, don't touch the knife. My thing is, I didn't understand why Allison reacted like that. Like, he's literally on the ground wearing fucking coveralls and a Michael Myers mask sitting right next to his head. yeah. But then the thing that turns her to Laurie's side is later, and this is what I was going to say earlier, later she drives down the street and she sees in the distance what she somehow knows to be the radio station on fire mm -hmm. and then hears that, that Laurie called in a suicide on like the police radio somehow. And then she, and that's what makes her realize, like, oh, he was bad because he's burning the town I down. I will say that was a little bit too convenient to like have everything line up where she's like, oh, okay, and then she comes back. I, I yeah, will say I think, it's a little reach, a little bit. I, I, I feel like the, the 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 line that they kept repeating about like burn everything to the ground i yeah. don't think that she i think her seeing the radio station literally on fire mm -hmm. was what was like oh like he was he meant it literally yeah and i think that was what the switch that and then she was like oh fuck i don't even think like uh frank calling and saying that she reported a suicide mm -hmm. i don't even think that that was what caused her to go back I think it was seeing the thing in flames and realizing, okay, I, because she had to have seen him, the mask on mm -hmm. the ground. Yeah. See, uh, yeah, I don't know. This part's a little bit confusing to me. See, so I do have a little bit of a criticism with the ending only because I do think it's, it goes a little bit too fast. I think it just like, they're trying to wrap up a little bit. And so that's why I was thinking, like, it's a little too convenient. I think they were trying to have, like, script-wise, a way for her to come back and believe her. Um, and I feel like they wrote themselves into a corner when they, like, had her being, you know, right over Corey while he was, like, stabbed and bleeding. Um, which then they say, like, you know what? This makes sense. I feel like it, she needs to come back somehow. Yeah, I would just, I, oh, no, no, now that I'm thinking about it, now that I'm thinking about it, putting aside, okay, I will, I do have the criticism of Allison walking in and freaking out and not clearly seeing that the fucking mask is right next to him. I would have, it would have made more sense if when Lori pulled it off of him, like she like threw it to the side. Yeah. To where Allison wouldn't be able to see it because she wouldn't question the fact that he was in overalls because he works at a, Mm -hmm. uh, that's true. or whatever that's true. Um, it was just the ma the mask positioning didn't make much sense to me but i think her seeing this the, the the radio station on fire and then going back is because that was the moment where she realized like no 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 no, grandmother thank god she didn't call her that in this movie uh <laughs> she was right like he he meant it literally so i think she was just going back to be like you were right Oh, and then she okay, just okay. happened upon the actual the actual the stuff. House. Um, okay, that that makes sense. I I, I do believe that. Um, oh, but yeah, to your point, I do. I uh, that the whole kitchen sequence and fight needed an additional like five minutes. I, I would have preferred so. a little bit more of cat and mouse versus just sticking to a hand in hand fight in the kitchen. No, which I still don't understand how she was able to do that. What you don't think Jamie Lee Curtis has muscles? You don't think she can just like not against his big ass? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean Corey I that just going kicked his ass before. I mean, that's true because yeah, because technically he hadn't killed anybody. He hadn't killed anybody in like a day. <laughs> <laughs> the man's got to well, feed. Yeah, the man's got to feed. Um, I this is uh, this is apparently like the love for H two O um episode. But nothing like the moment where she like lets uh, her her son and his girlfriend off. She hits the 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 little glitch thing for the door, um, grabs her axe and just like has that shot where she screams Michael and she's ready to battle him. We get like a battle between them where she like 
uh, is not the the superior one, and then she she then gets uh, a hold of him, and then they're like running around through the through the school. And then not even there, it doesn't end there. It then has a whole another section where she grabs um, the gun, right? No, the axe. She grabs mm-hmm. the axe and takes the car and tries to like go away with him. We have that whole sequence. I feel like that's such a great ending and battle between Laurie and Michael, in my opinion, of course. Um, I feel like this one happened a little bit too quickly and it was just placed in one location. I wish it kind of just like... As you said, it was a little bit cat and mouse, and maybe she ran away a little bit, or maybe we got a glimpse of that. She was a little bit scared as to like what she was gonna do in this moment. Yeah, I I think H two O, the way that they, it it it's a little bit it's more simplistic, the what they're trying to tell. Uh, with with her overcoming, you know, uh, facing her demons and yeah. deciding to to face him head on versus continuing to run and to do that in a in a way like she like in h2o she has no idea whether or not she's actually going to be able to kill him because like even her taking him with the van like she knows he's alive but she like i guarantee you she didn't have a fucking plan like she didn't know where she was going with with that van she she, like like, accidentally well no she purposely went off the road though right yeah i mean i think like at that at that at that that point point, that wasn't really she, she was like we're both going. We're on. both going. Um, but like it's in H two O, she has the, you know, what you were just saying. Like she has the 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 look on her face where she looks back up the driveway mm-hmm. and then looks back at Josh Hart and she's just like go, because she's like, I can't do this anymore. And then she's she breaks the gate so that uh, uh, when the cops get there they can't immediately get in mm-hmm. and that Michael potentially can't get out. Yeah. Uh, and it, it feels more natural and it feels like a proper build up to what we got. Whereas in ends, while I do very much so enjoy the ending. Yeah. Again, I guess which my cats are in the bedroom and they heard the feeder go off and they're pounding against the door. Um, Don't worry. I'm holding I'm holding my dog back right now. <laughs> <laughs> they uh, it, it feels very happenstance. Like she didn't know that Michael was going to show up. Yeah. So it, it feels very not something that they just added in, although I could see that argument being made because Michael is not the focus of the movie. Yeah. But I do, based on the marketing, it's, you know, they, everything was Lori versus Michael. Yeah. And this is not that. It's, it's you just so happen to get a scene at the end that is Lori versus Michael. It's a great scene. But yeah, I, I think it could have... We could have used an additional like five minutes of cat and mouse, a little bit of a chase throughout the house and stuff like that. Yeah, just just a little bit. Uh, but again, I I do like this ending. I think it's interesting. I was because I haven't seen a fight between Lori and Michael where the the fact is that she might die, and this might be another yeah. instance where we see Lori Strode died. So I was still on edge and. In suspense as to what was going on um and who was going to win at the end um i <laughs> i think i think that the her hitting him the first hit that she gets in on him is with a fire extinguisher and in halloween h2o the yeah. first hit she gets in yes. is a fire extinguisher yes. so i thought that that was probably uh, an homage to that and i <laughs> loved when she pins him to the uh the center island yeah that he's still trying to kick her (laughs) with his one free leg oh my god i mean hey i i we live for for badass women in on in horror Mm -hmm. and she she managed to be smart about it i I, yes there is that argument that like how is she able to find the strength to to do this um but push that fridge over fridges are heavy (laughs) yeah yeah, and she's just like, she like I one do arm. It. I'm dead. Pull it over. I'm dead. We'll just say that that Activia. <laughs> y'all don't know. Y'all don't understand. She the is strength cleansed. That it you. She is cleansed. Exactly. She is ready to go. A fight ensues, and Lori manages to pin Michael to the table. After a struggle, Allison arrives to help subdue and finally kill him. Um, oh, we also do have the the reference to Halloween H two O, where you know, and I think this was mentioned before when the trailer was coming out with the whole hand in the. Uh, yeah, garbage disposal. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't know things. It's fine. Um, <laughs> and, and the knitting needle. And the knitting needle. Yes, yes, yes. Lori and Allison take his body to the savage yard. Now, before this, she does, and I forget what she says. Uh, she she says something to him and like slowly uh, cuts, his, <gasps> cuts his neck. I love I love this dialogue. So, so I don't know it word for word, but she says like, I have feared you. I mm -hmm. have run from you. I have tried to contain you. I have tried to forgive you. I thought that you were the boogeyman, but you're just a man who's about to stop breathing. Mm -hmm. yes. But I also like what she does is she flips the knife and like shows him his own face. Yes. Which I loved. I which, loved. which always gave me a vibe like a little nod to a lot of the posters that had always just like the knife and the reflections. And I feel yeah. like this is, this is the, the end. It's it kind of like encapsulates everything all at once. And this is the final straw and the way that he, she slowly slices his neck. Um, very cool. Um, I will say though, and maybe this is why, I mean, H2O will forever reign supreme for me, but I think part of the, it's what so many people say, especially like when I show people Halloween Kills or I watch reactions to Halloween Kills or I hear people talking about Halloween Kills, like they're always like it during uh, when the mob scene happens at the end and they're all beating the shit out of him in the street and everybody's like, why isn't somebody just fucking cutting off his head or stabbing him in the head? And I thought yes. the same thing in this. Yeah. Like, I, thankfully, yes, then we eventually get her throwing him into the, the thresher, I think it's called. Uh, but I'm like, why are you slitting his throat? and yeah. stabbing him in the side like pop that sucker right in the middle of his forehead because i thought yeah. that in, at the end of kills when allison has the knife or not allison karen in, in in the street yeah like she stabs him in his back and i was like his head's right there girl exactly i mean or like go for go for the spinal cord at least like like paralyze everything thing, below the neck my only thing is that i maybe she wanted him to suffer a little bit more that's why she kind of gave him like a slow death, but obviously like later on, they just throw him in, in that machine. Um, but again, I, there's nothing like Halloween each show when she's just like, you know what? Well, fuck you. Brah. Well, bam, you get like the, oh, that man. musical cue, the meow, like, and you just see his head rolling. Um, I will say it, it was as satisfying to see him go down the, the shredder because it's like, there's nothing left of him unless like his his soul just like comes out. You know? Yeah, but what I can't it get over a tiny bit CGI looking to me, just um, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know why they didn't just take a body and put it through the shredder. I mean, come on. But <laughs> <laughs> what I can't get over for this scene is that ostensibly nobody knows about the bodies in the graveyard because Corey was the only person who walked out of there alive, and he is now also in the dead. graveyard. Not in the graveyard. Oh, in the, the salvage yard. The salvage yard, yeah. And and so this processional goes to the salvage yard, and then nobody reacts to all of these bodies that they just found That's and didn't true. know were dead. They're just like, well, Michael's dead now, and I guess maybe you could <laughs> chalk it up to like just say that it's Michael, and that it's just more bodies. But I would have think that at least like some of the people, maybe the cops, would have wanted to contain that scene at least a little bit because you've got bodies out on the like on the gate to get in that also has a car on it that somehow like I don't know how they got past that. There's a lot of questions for me. I like I like that they got the final thing of like like what I've always said, which is why not just do something that like puts the body into as many different pieces as possible. Like, of course he can't recover from this, but the, it raises so many more questions of like, there's so many other things that they should be seeing in the salvage yard that they're just not reacting to because it doesn't, I guess it doesn't matter because Michael's now Michael's dead. dead. I do like the parading of him around on top yes. of the car. I think that's very meaningful for the town of Haddonfield mm -hmm. to see, um, which was really nice. That's the that's the downfall of Halloween H two O is a little bit is that it took place nowhere near Haddonfield, and I feel it would have been like a little extra meaningful to have it be in Haddonfield. 
Um, I can see that. I can see that. I personally am like, I'm thankful that Scream 6 is not in Woodsboro anymore. Mm -hmm. I was thankful that Halloween H2O was That's in true. California because I don't like, you know, it's kind of like how people are like, I don't like the fact that they're siblings. And I'm like, well, I don't like the the fact that it's always in Haddonfield because it like, okay, just don't go to Haddonfield and you're fine. That's true. <laughs> So I like that it expands out, but I get I, to your point. I get what you're saying. Um, I do. Yeah, I don't know. Now, now that's going to be in my head. I don't know how they didn't notice the bodies. <laughs> oh, sorry. I don't actually. Actually, I don't even know why Corey would have led them back to. I mean, I guess because it was secluded. Yeah. But like, why kill them there? Well, I, d I do want to like ask you a question. How do you feel about Cor how Corey's plot line ended because i i'm a little bit i struggle a little bit just because i feel like he was so important to this plot line and then he does die but then we do forget about him a little bit afterwards um that's the only thing i struggle with yeah i it just feels like there's certain sections that needed an additional like five to ten minutes like there are mm -hmm. I wasn't, yeah, as soon as Corey kills himself, well, technically he doesn't kill himself. Michael kills him. Yeah, which, exactly. Apparently everybody in Haddonfield just has like <laughs> exceptional throats. <laughs> like, nobody seems to die from the throat, throat game is strong in Haddonfield. They, it, <laughs> yes. There's something in the water. Um. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I'm not mad at it, but I do wish that there was a little bit more in the, in the coda. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Allison does make the comment, like, sh she acknowledges, yes, I know that Corey killed those people. Yeah. But beyond that, it's just like, okay, well, what else about Corey? <laughs> <laughs> because he's literally been all we've watched this whole movie. Yeah. And it's it's really a sad ending. And I feel like his redemption, which was, like, to fight off Michael, happened here and there and then dead. Um and for me, I just feel like it's still sad because I feel like the the town is still going to think, unless they all just blame it on Michael and not blame it on Corey. But I still feel like it's that thing where Haddonfield people are still going to think Corey has this monster and he never gets his like redemption from that. Yeah, I, I think a better way to, that they should have done it is like you, you can still have the, the 2018 film being the 2018 film. And then I think kills should have been this. This should have been yeah. the middle chapter, and then ends should have been wrapping everything, all the storylines up from kills, and then leading to a final confrontation between. I think so, Gloria because then you can have it be like, at this moment, now Michael is fully strong, and him, he's gotten to where he needed to go, and now we have another story to tell, and you know, even more mayhem. Um, I completely agree with that. I think yeah. I, I would have definitely liked this one to be the middle one because it wouldn't it wouldn't feel like a middle one because it, it was such a complex uh, complex storyline, and then people would have gotten interested in this how different this was and followed the plot line a little bit more for a grand finale because that is what people have been saying is that this didn't feel like um, people who did like the the plot line, the, how different it was, felt like it shouldn't have been the grand finale for the for the series. Correct. It doesn't. It, it, the end scene is fine if that's what they wanted to do with the finale. Yeah. But that it shouldn't have been tacked on to the preceding. Exactly. Movie. I do agree because you that. have twenty eighteen and kills is all about Michael Myers, and then you've like they've done nothing but market this movie as Laurie versus Michael. Like Michael shouldn't even have been on the fucking cover of this movie. Yeah, like the poster I, because he's barely in the movie, and I I'm not mad so. that he's barely in the movie. It's just they falsely advertised it. 100%. Yeah, I yeah. I definitely think so. Um, but overall, I did enjoy how much of a risk they took, and I felt. And you know what? It's also because like I also don't forget the other entries to the franchise too. Like we've seen elements of this stuff in previous installments like halloween 4 but they didn't really elaborate on that so it's kind of like this is that elaborated version of that which um i right. liked and i i thought it was a much more um how can i say like concise story um again for a finale it doesn't make sense but i do enjoy it for what it is 
Mm -hmm. I think uh, this this has references to Halloween Four with you know Janie and the evil being passed. I'm like, this is what this is with people getting pissed off about this and saying mm -hmm. this is not this is not my Halloween. This is not my Michael Myers. There is no one version of Michael Myers. You have a normal person who maybe might be supernatural, <laughs> but we're really not sure. The biggest mystery in the first one is how the fuck did he learn to drive a car? Yep. Yes. That's the first one. And then you have the second one where he walks like a robot and he can be, survive being shot in the face and being set on fire. And then you're like, okay, so he's full-blown supernatural. Yeah. Then you have Halloween 4, which has an absolutely hideous mask. And he can't even move because he's a bulky him. man. Like... He's, he's just like this the whole time. And he looks goofy in four. And then yeah. in five, like, again, how y'all going to be hating on Halloween ends? And then you have Halloween five that in, literally introduced some magical thorn mm -hmm. tattoo and this man in black character that they never explain in that movie. And the movie, I don't, I mean, am I, I'm spoiling something right now, right? Have you guys seen all of these? I, he oh, has it. Yes. Okay, hasn't. so it's um, fine. It's fine. I don't think you would get the, it either way. <laughs> so I mean, but then there's literally at the end of Halloween five, he is in jail. Yeah, they have a He's scene. He's chained up in jail. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Twiddling his thumbs. <laughs> and then in Halloween six, like he's in. He's being controlled by a cult. Yeah. I mean, you also kind of have to think because we've been praising Halloween H two O, but even Halloween H two O, the Michael in in that in that movie, is all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's five different masks. Is it's he's he's a different vibe, but I still love that movie. Um, we've gotten so many different Michaels throughout this whole franchise, and um, you know, I. I, I think this is. I think this should be taken as no different, and I think maybe within time, people will be a little bit more um, welcoming. And I think that goes with any other entry to to a Halloween movie. I think you need another one for this one to be praised a little bit more. I guess. Right. I mean, yeah. It, eventually, we will get more installments, and people will bitch about those. And the cycle will just continue. Because like guess what? I end. sat there and I saw Halloween kills and I thought to myself, this isn't the Michael that I like because he ain't stalking people. He's not sticking to the shadows. Mm -hmm. He's not being playful. He's just murdering everybody. Yeah. But the difference is I didn't make a fucking petition over it. <laughs> I went, that's fine. I'll move on. I got Scream 5. I'm good. <laughs> <sighs> Um, oh, before we forget, one thing that I, we didn't talk about that uh, is actually, it might be my favorite scene in the movie, is uh -huh. uh, Laurie and Frank at the supermarket. <gasps> oh, yes. yes! I meant to bring it up when we were talking about uh, how people were mad at Laurie, but the most sweet, like such a sweet scene. It, it, oh my God. And like the, the callback, the, the second that he starts like, flirting with her and then she about she her hair the, and then she yes. starts twirling the hair and like i know david cried in his reaction and i was fighting back tears when i watched it because uh what i explained to my friend uh is i said this is the first time except uh, maybe a little bit with h2o but this is really the first time that we've got to see Lori just be Lori and yeah. just live her life like because we forget that Lori was another person before all this stuff happened all the other entries had a Lori that was just down had trauma was going through it um but what i like most about the original one is that we get such a sweet lori and how they're talking about boys and how she was like don't tell ben tramer she was still this awkward teenager and right. to get that sense again for even a little bit was so nice and i felt uh I wanted to cry when when they ruined that as soon as she got into the parking lot. I know. I'm, I know you're mad. <laughs> she got stabbed in the neck, but can you let the fucking Lori be happy for 30 seconds, please? No, she's not allowed. Not allowed. <laughs> she I want oh I'm so glad that she's finally gonna get her cherry blossoms. But at the end, because we do get a little bit of a, a post scene about what how she is, how she's doing, and how at peace she is. That is something that I would have loved to tack on to Halloween H2O was like, let's see her live her life a little bit. And she seems to be living her life. And, you know, she's with um, 
she talks to oh fuck i forgot his name frank talks to frank mm-hmm. they're at the uh, on the stairs and then we get reference to 1978 um for me i don't i don't think i heard anything but if i didn't that would be great we had those shots of where like you know we have different shots throughout the house throughout different locations but it's all it's si- excellent callback but it's all silent and that for me was so full circle and I loved it because at the end of 78, obviously you heard, you saw the same locations, but it was with Michael's breathing and you can feel him around the whole idea that like he's everywhere, no matter where you like, you don't know where he is, but he's, he's, he's looking, he's stalking you. Um, and having it just be silent felt so beautiful to me just cause it, was, it like, yeah, it's a beautiful ending. Yeah. It was a beautiful way to tie it off. And, and, and while I do think that H2O's ending with her just chopping his head off, you hearing her like breathing, like I did it, I'm yes. done. And then it cuts to black. That will be forever my favorite, but yeah. I will say that I am very glad that they didn't just have him in ends, throw him into that machine and then and be credits. done. Yeah. That, 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 that was the best way to pay homage and give a thank you back to the original film Mm -hmm. while also making it make sense narratively with what you've tried to tell throughout the trilogy. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's something about it that makes me feel like even while watching it, I was just thinking of all the mayhem that happened because of Michael, even taking into account all the other franchises, I mean, all the other franchises, all the other entries and all these sequels, just everything that Michael was, in that one bit it's just like it's over people can be at peace for just like this second until they produce another one but <laughs> i did read uh or did you see the the interview with uh david gordon green where he was talking about what they originally had done for the ending to this no oh no mask? what happened okay. <laughs> so I, lo- lo- low key though i think that they should have left it but okay um, Apparently, at the the original, they didn't film it, but the original draft that they like they had shot almost the entire movie. Uh, uh, David Gordon Green said every single copy up until they changed the ending at the last minute had the final battle not happening at Lori's house. It was happening at a Silver Shamrock mask factory, <gasps> and the end of the movie, similar to what we got, <sighs> where you see the mask on her uh, table, yeah. Forever, that the camera pans into the mask and there's a silver shamrock thing on the back of the mask. And that was how they were going to tie it into Halloween three and maybe give you a little yes. bit of an explanation as to why Michael is what he is. Oh, that would have been, been That would have been fucking awesome. Wait, that did they, awesome. did they film it? You said mm-hmm. they, they didn't. <gasps> Let me see if I can find, yeah, they didn't oh. film it, but that would, oh, yeah, I would have been gagged. So, so you don't know, uh, the, the the reference right oh, silver shamrock right yeah so that is the company that makes the masks in um in halloween 3 which is the skeleton the witch and the pumpkin mm-hmm. um but w- i think all of this will start to make sense to you once we watch it yeah he said there was an ending i wrote that we never filmed and it takes place at silver shamrock factory as it was spitting out the witch skeleton and jack-o'-lantern masks and then it started spitting out michael myers masks <sighs> that would have been insane and i would have yeah. loved it i again i i love this ending i love i love how it was done but it would have just given me that extra oomph um if it was that i agree i agree but Maybe, uh, I mean, I feel like eventually we have to get some some sort of other installment that has something to do with uh, Halloween 3. I, I think it. so. You totally I could. It. I think it's such a cult classic now that people would embrace it um, because they know what they're getting th- themselves into. So I feel like that would be cool. All right, guys. We're going to go ahead and take one last break, and then we're going to go into our Just Desserts. So stay tuned. Welcome back, ghouls. It is now time to go into our... Just desserts. 
segment. And this is a segment where we rate the movie first from zero to 10 scared Cody's on how scary it was. And then from zero to 10, we need to name something. Zero to 10. Scarecrow masks. Scarecrow masks. There we go. Let's do it. Perfect. Let's do it. And then from zero to 10, Scarecrow Mask on how we would rate this movie overall. Uh, let's start with our guest of honor, Nick. From zero to 10, Scared Cody's. How scary was this? Mm, four. It's not very scary. It's a good yeah. movie. It's not very scary. There was a couple parts, though, that made me jump. Yeah, absolutely. Cody? I would say... Uh, I would say five and a half because there was some gore that I had to look away from, but overall it wasn't like scary, scary. Yeah. I'm going to give this a three because usually, I mean, by this time, Halloween movies, um, are much more of like entertaining and on the fun side for me, uh, which is for me a great Halloween movie, um, so it wasn't as scary, but I do have to give credit to this trilogy for, I think, genuinely uh, making Michael scary. I think he was a pretty fierce uh, presence in these movies, mm-hmm. and I, I, I do appreciate that. Uh, from 0 to 10, Scarecrow Masks, Nick, how would you rate this movie overall? I would give this a 7. Oh, Okay. I would give it, uh, it, it's not without its issues. Uh, see, now I feel like I'm like rating it too high. Okay, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm just going, I'm not going to rate this as compared to the other Halloween films. I'm just going to, my overall experience, just purely with this film, I would give That's this fair. a seven. I think it, it definitely has its issues. There are certain ideas that seem a little bit undercooked, but overall it it was a compelling story about trauma uh and the way that that success or uh, they they successfully conveyed what they were talking about in the pre- in the previous film with how it affected the people around uh Michael Myers yeah. and i i loved the uh, the story with Corey i loved the score and i thought that from a narrative perspective it had a really really uh good ending a very final final ending a good send off to this iteration of Lori. Yeah. I I think I would agree and say that I would give this a seven because overall I liked it. And, and yeah, there were definitely points where I'm like, why did they do this? Or like, this doesn't make a ton of sense, but I do like that it, that it does tie everything up with Lori really nicely. And I also just like, I, I like the Lori that we have in this too. I, I can't believe that none of us brought up the line about ripping our shirts off and showing grief <gasps> our tits. Like, <laughs> I, would, I love oh, that. Oh, oh, yeah. That was one of the things that I was going to bring up before, before <laughs> we left. You're so right. I, I forgot that about line, that. You know Danny that McBride wrote is, that. Oh, yeah. That's the peanut butter on my penis line of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, but I love it. I love it. Oh, yeah, I'm fine with it. But as soon as she said that, I was like, okay, girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I liked it overall. Definitely going to rewatch it. Um, and I, I, I do like also, and I know we said this earlier, I like that this contextualizes some of the stuff in Halloween Kills that I didn't like as much before. I think it makes a little bit more sense now as a group, uh, as a trilogy of movies. Yeah, I'm going to give it a seven also with exactly what you guys said. Um, I still do think Halloween kills could be unnecessary and, you know, skip that over. But I do like that, you know, we're getting more of the plot and what they were, I think, aiming to do um, overall. I had a good time with this movie. I think um, at the end of it, they took a risk. And for me. I think it was really great to dive into that. It was something fresh. Um, I agree with some people, and that's why it's at a seven, that you know, it could have been done a little bit differently, maybe not for the finale. I totally get that um, and respect everyone's opinions if they don't like it. Um, but I also do feel like it's just like an emotional thing because realistically, this might be the last time we'll ever see Jamie Lee Curtis play this role. Um, and she's done it, you know, she's been the face of it for so many years. And just that 
impact and what that means to so many people, um, I I have to give that credit to this movie for giving us that really great ending for Laurie um, and Jamie Lee Curtis's Laurie. Um, and that concludes our Halloween Ends episode. Nick, I have to say thank you so much for coming on and honestly blowing our minds with so many revelations of this movie. Like we have opened our minds. You have given <laughs> us so many, just like Laurie, just so many deep thoughts <laughs> about about this movie. We really appreciate you. Well, I appreciate you guys asking me to come on here. I've been waiting to meet you guys for a while and I didn't know if it was like somehow going to happen on the horror hour or something like that. <laughs> I'm glad that it happened this way. You guys yeah, are wonderful yeah. and I, this was really great. Thank you so much. Before we leave, uh, let the, the viewers, the listeners, one last time, let them know where they can find you. So you can check out my YouTube channel at Nick Says Boo. You can check me out on social media at Nick Says Boo. You can check me out on Patreon at Nick Says Boo. And yes. just my, my final thing to say is if you're going through it, just look grief in the face and pull out your tits <laughs> and just say fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> I told you I need that on like one of those wooden boards that I can put outside of my, my or like door. a cross stitch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Like make it like old lady. Like I love it. Um, all right, guys, that is our episode. Thank you so much for listening for this week. Happy Halloween. That's uh, we're going to aim for this episode to come out on Halloween, hopefully. Um, but you can find us uh, wherever you listen to podcasts. You can go over to our YouTube channel. Uh, we have stuff there as well. Um, you can also go and follow us on anywhere social media wise. Uh, on Instagram at the horror bandwagon or on Twitter at horror bandwagon or the um, and I think that's it we have been your source for horror analysis criticism and spooky okay? and sometimes cooking entertainment bye everyone bye